on cue. We got our recording going. So welcome everyone. We'll call this meeting to order. This is our building, fire, and plumbing committee meeting. Uh, we will start with welcome and introductions. Agenda item number one. Can we please get a roll call? Tony? Here. Cody? Here. Todd? Todd Bayreuther? Micah? Micah Chappell? Here. I thought you were on vacation. <laughs> this is what happens when you schedule meetings back to back to back, Stoy, and I'm blaming it on you. <laughs> ah, okay, thank you. <laughs> I postponed my vacation too. Damon Dole? I'm here. Robert Hamlin? Here, but I'm going to be leaving in about an hour. Sorry. Okay. Roger? Here, Inga. I'm here. Okay. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, and Todd Byrath is here too. Oh, okay. Sorry, I didn't. I, I signed in late. Thanks. We have a quorum. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Is there anyone from the public that would like to be recognized? Uh, yes. This is Ted Clifton. Terry Beals representing Sound Transit. Good to see everyone. Welcome, Terry. Tim Atterbury, Associated General Contractors of Washington. Welcome, Tim. This is Chris Edmark, Thurston County. Welcome, Chris. Bruce Chatton, Washington Agris and Concrete Association. Welcome, Bruce. Mike Thank Guinness, you. the Association of Washington Business. Welcome, Michael. Ted Clifton, Zero Energy Plans. Okay. I missed that one. New Buildings Institute. Okay. Larry Andrews, Andrews Mechanical General Contractor. Welcome, Larry. John Weastman, member. John Weastman, uh, representing the Composite Lumber Manufacturers Association, CLMA. Thank you. Thank you. Kathleen Petrie, King County. Welcome, Kathleen. Frank Boykin, <laughs> Manufacturing Industrial Council for the South Sound, Tacoma Pierce County Chamber. Thank you, Frank. Rachel Jamison, American Wood Council. Thank you, Rachel. Jeanette McKaig, Washington Realtors. Welcome, Jeanette. John Sue, uh, Washington Association of Building Officials. Welcome, John. Kenley Deller, King County Solid Waste. Welcome. Okay, excellent. Let's move on to agenda item number two, which is review and approve the agenda. Go ahead and take a look at the share screen. I, I uh, need to make a statement. Agenda item three, we don't have uh, minutes prepared. We have the draft, but we, we didn't have the time to pause the minutes. So if we can skip that agenda item three. Thank you, Stoyan. So if that agenda looks good with that modification, and looking this is Corey. I make a motion that we approve the agenda with that modification of no minutes. Thank second. You. I'll second. Thank you, Micah. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any aye. against? Okay, motion carries. Excellent. Okay, we will go to agenda item three, which is now review code change proposals for group two codes. And we will start with the IEBC. So, uh, and IBC structural. Uh, in the agenda, we have IBC, but if, if the uh, committee members want different order, we can we can switch, it's, it's up to you. No, we'll, we'll just go with it, how it's written. Okay. Let me show you my screen. Do you see the spreadsheet? Yes. Okay. So uh, let me clarify a little bit what you see in the spreadsheet. The uh, first three proposals, uh, they were already approved by the council. They were proposed for group one. Uh, however, because these three proposals are 
part of chapters that are structural chapters. So we just move these three proposals uh, for uh, group two codes. The, the rest of it you see in green and red, uh, the recommendations uh, by the technical advisory group, a proof was submitted, and we have two uh, proposals that were uh, uh, recommended uh, for a disapprove. Uh, it was similar uh, a spreadsheet, similar document is posted on the website, so I hope you, you all had enough time to review the proposals and the modifications to the proposals. So it's... Uh, if you want me to open something, I I'm ready to do it. Just let me know how you want to proceed. Okay, um, real quickly, just so uh, the building fire plumbing committee members are on the same page. This is for um, as far as action today that we're taking. We are looking to to move this to council for Friday. Is that correct, Stan? That's correct. Yes. All right, just so committee members are aware of our action today. Todd, so you can you can agree with the TAC recommendation when you can disagree with the TAC recommendation. So you you, uh, you can uh, modify proposals. Uh, it's uh, part of today's meeting. Thank you, Stan. Go ahead, Todd. Thank you, Tony. Uh, so just to clarify, so the action that was taken on the three previous proposals last year, when it says council accepted it, that means accepted to move into the CR 102 on this cycle. That's correct, yes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, is there anything that, that the building fire plumbing committee members would like to discuss and uh, uh, as far as the IBC structural coaching proposals go? We'll open it up for discussion now. Okay. Um, is there, Todd, are you able to go through this and just briefly explain kind of what, what the, the tag came up with here? Sure, I can. Thank you. Add a little commentary to this. So, um, so greetings, everyone. I'm, I'm Todd Byrther. I'm the um, manufacturing representative and also east of the Cascades for the State Building Code Council, and, and I serve as chair of um, or I have served as chair as the IB, on the IBC and IEBC technical advisory group for this, uh, this cycle. So we went through, um, um, I, I think, a, a robust process. I want to thank everyone involved, um, especially the, the TAG members and the stakeholders. Um, many of these uh, proposals, uh, um, I don't want to ca characterize them all together necessarily, but um, we're, we're very thoughtful. Um, a few of them, such as the AC7 um, uh, proposal, uh, was was one that the the, the council, for example, uh, has already considered an emergency rulemaking. Uh, so, bringing some of the ASC7, you know, 22 um, provisions into our Chapter 16 on this on in the 2021 um, amended code is um, it, it was a good example of 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 uh, of you know, a larger scale proposal. Um, the, um, of course, the ones that we spent the most time on were these two that are marked disapproved, the greenhouse gas emission reduction for steel and then for concrete chapter. And then in, um, there was a third one throughout the tag process um, that combined steel, concrete and um, engineered wood products. So that, that did, um, giving those, you know, fair, um, consideration and, and, and making sure that every stakeholder was that wanted to you know give input at the tag level was heard um, I think these two were um, marked as disapproval um, you know I think there was recognized that there was some merit going forward but but there's a lot of work to be done and I think it's really up to the BFP and and the, and the council to determine if if it's appropriate to continue for continuance of consideration of, of those topics. Um, those were probably the, the most contentious. Um, otherwise, uh, I think the other major one I'm seeing as we're looking at this list here is, is the tsunami codes. As, as you remember, just give a little bit of uh, characterization of that. That 
let out of the lengthy process, which um, I was I was involved with as we created an ad hoc tag about a year and a half, two years ago. Uh, that's a process that included um, uh, to our natural resources and, and, and other, um, you know, other kind of deep level of um, um, experts. And then once that uh, ad hoc tag moved forward an emergency rule that the council adopted, then this is coming forward to us now because it is appropriate that it's in chapter 16. So this is now um, uh, a revised um, proposal to formally put this in the 2021 code. So you'll see that's why it's in chapter 16. So when that once we got through the emergency rulemaking, then we dissolve that tsunami tag because it's more appropriate for the IBC tag to consider it and move it through the BFP committee. Um, I'll stop there because uh, I think those were the, the most important to you know, acknowledge the, the ones that were marked for disapproval and for approved estimate. Thank you, Todd. Appreciate the overview of that. <clears throat> Micah, go ahead. I just had a question on the list that Stoyan showed on the screen. In your notes, you have items in there that are not on the document through the agenda or the website. And so I want to make sure when we vote that we the notes aren't, a, aren't necessary. Uh, let's just say um, for Eric Vandermeer's proposal, you have in yellow to relocate to 107.2.9. Is that the action that was taken? Is that the modification or the notes relevant for our voting? Sorry, Stoyan, just to clarify. I'm sorry, I was muted. So these notes here are uh, most likely for staff uh, to consider important action. So this, uh, the modification was that this uh, proposal, the section needs to be relocated to 107.29. Uh, however, I don't have detailed no notes based on the TAC decision. Uh, I mean, we had long discussions and even if I want to include the notes, I don't know how I can include everything. And it's very difficult to summarize uh, to summarize the notes. Uh, That's perfect. I just wanted to know because and, and, it is just a different looking document. Just want to verify what the notes for. Thanks. No, the, the notes, I'm showing the notes here because, you know, it's it's a draft. Uh, it's a working document, it's a working uh, spreadsheet, and the official spreadsheet is posted on the website. And the notes here, uh, again, it shouldn't be part of your decision today. The notes are uh, clarifying notes for staff, uh, how we can proceed with, with uh, uh, these proposals. Thank you, Stoyan. Uh, any other comments or questions from our committee members? Okay, this item does include public comment. Is there anyone from the public that has a question or comment? Rachel, go ahead. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to speak this morning. I want to simply um, agree with the TAG's um, vote to disagree, to disapprove um, the two recommendations regarding um, regulation of greenhouse gases last week. Um, the vote was the right vote. Um, the proposal contains language that has been contemplated by the Washington State Legislature two years in a row and has not left committee. It's a conversation that many material uh, sectors, the wood products included, would like to have in a policy forum as was discussed at the end of last legislative session. The building code is not the place to regulate carbon, embodied carbon specifically. These proposals by the same propon proponents were heard by the ICC this spring and did not gain any traction. 
Um, they are more appropriately presented at ASHRAE 189.1, which feeds into the Green Building Code standard. So again, in a nutshell, want to affirm uh, last week's, last, the, the TAG's vote to disapprove last week. That was the right vote. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Tim, go ahead. Yeah, this is Tim with uh, the Associated General Contractors of Washington. And I sat in on the, uh, the TAG meetings um, on the two proposals that Rachel just talked about. I just, I just wanted to um, let folks know that those votes were not close. Um, I think they were seven to two votes and seven to one type votes. So I just wanted to add um, that to the conversation that the, uh, the votes were not close to disapprove. Thank you, Tim. Appreciate it. Any other comments from the public? Bruce, go ahead. Yes, sir. Thank you. Unfortunately, I'm on my phone. I can't um, uh, get on uh, on video. However, I do want to support what Rachel and Tim just said. Um, we're a primary st stakeholder in the discussion, and we ex um, expressed a number of concerns about the process, about the inability to uh, stakeholders to have any input into the process, getting revised proposals with very short notice to be able to provide any uh, review or content or have a greater discussion. Um, as Tim said, the votes were very definitive, 6-2, um, 7-2 with one abstaining. Um, and, the, and our challenge was, and my question to all the committees is, when does a proposal come to the TAG or the council and it gets to be so dramatically and substantially modified by the folks that propose the, uh, the proposal to begin with when the proposal no longer really has any valid merit and or the councils or, or different committee members would look at the proposal and say, okay, this is clearly not ready. Uh, there's too much objection um, and should either be reconsidered or just simply tabled for any further consideration. Um, given the strength of the vote, and I understand the SPCC process with the BFP, um, it's a little strange that we have uh, a proposal that was so definitively disapproved moving forward to another process that could modify pick up or advance or maintain the disapproval. So um, I'm learning this process for the first time. We'll certainly be engaged. I appreciate the considerations and I appreciate the considerations of the people on the tag, the group that Todd had um, uh, managed, um, but we still would like to uh, maintain, as Tim said, these were not close votes. This was a very definitive decision by the tag and we hope that the um, review by those technical experts will continue to, to resonate with the BFP. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bruce. Stoyan, would you like to speak to that? Yes, uh, just a clarification, a uh, comment for clarification. I don't want to be uh, advocating in either way, but, uh, and, and I also, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of, you know, submitting proposals as a placeholder and then modifying completely the proposal, but uh, uh, at this time, the proposals were modified as a request after request by the technical advisory group. So uh, I just don't want to provide misleading messages. Uh, there was a request by the technical advisory group, and this is why the proposals were modified. Thank you, Stan. Tom, go ahead. If I may, can I just kind of Tom, like uh, I don't have a, I don't can I just have a um, a clarification with either the BFP or Stoyan? Story and I haven't had the opportunity to check with the website or anything or the proposal that's sitting before the BFP now. Are they the same proposals non-modified as when we left the TAG meeting or have these proposals since been modified after the TAG meeting? The proposals hasn't been modified after the TAG meeting. So we had the proposals at the TAG meeting. There were some modifications during the TAC meetings, the yep. TAC meeting, the last one. And this is what you see on the website. And this is, you know, when you click on the links on this form, uh, uh, this is what you will read. There are not further modification between the end of the technical advisory group meeting, the last one, and today. Perfect. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Bruce and Stan. Tom, go ahead. Thank you. I'm Tom Kaczynski with APA, the Engineered Wood Association, headquartered in Tacoma. Um, I 
also agree with uh, Rachel's testimony. We are in favor of the tag um, recommendation for disapproval <laughs> on those uh, proposals. And uh, I just wanted to point out that it does represent a, a, a new scope of work for the code official. Um, and uh, I think before that gets into the code, um, first of all, we think it's better off handled in the legislative process, but if it's in the code, um, it needs to be much more clear and there's gonna be a significant amount of training and understanding on behalf of the code official that's gonna to have to take place. Thank, Thank you. you, Tom. Uh, Weebly. Hello, this is Webley Bowles. I am the proponent. I'm with New Buildings Institute. Um, I just wanna say, I really appreciate the time that the TAG took to consider these issues and that it's being considered again. Um, just briefly, this proposal is for EPD reporting for concrete steel and potentially wood, if that's, I don't know if that's still on the table or not. And it's here because we need this belt since the suspenders approach to addressing climate change. We need all the solutions that we can get. We need legislative process, we need codes, we need mar market-based solutions. And right now we only have that market-based solutions. So this proposal uses the existing policy mechanisms to safeguard the public from the hazards associated with the creation of um, greenhouse gas emissions from building products. So that's the reason why this was brought here. Um, and I also wanna note that since this code wouldn't go into effect for years, there is this phase in process to allow for education and awareness. And um, I just wanna to respond to one comment. The reason why the IBC did not proceed with this issue was, um, it was there was an assumed means and methods concern, which was not included in this proposal, since this is just looking at EPD reporting. So just wanted to share that. Thank you. Thank you, Webley. Appreciate it. Uh, Chris, go ahead. I'm glad they disapproved this. I don't believe it belongs in the building code. It believes on it belongs in the manufacturing side or in the legislative side, but it's it's not something that the building officials need to get involved with. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. Is there any further public comment? Uh, Larry, go ahead. As a general contractor, we have enough to deal with without figuring out how the concrete's going to affect the world that we need to, to build. What we need to do is be building as much as we can so we can house the people that we need to house. And this is just undue legislation that we don't need as builders. Uh, it's uh, it's getting to the point right now that you almost have to have a person on staff to figure out what kind of legislative things you're going to have to put up with, and 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 that's just adding cost costs that the people do not need to entail. This should be done with the manufacturers and the distributors. So when the builder comes out to the job, he orders concrete and he gets it. It, it this has gone berserk. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Seth, go ahead. Yes, hi, Seth Holt, Lehigh Northwest Cement Company. Uh, I represent a manufacturer as well as a, a sitting board member on the Washington Aggregates and Concrete Association. I am in agreement with Rachel, Bruce, Tim, Tom, and Larry in terms of the disapproval of the TAG's decision to disapprove um, both measures and a little bit perplexed in terms of the late addition um, of an additional uh, structural material later on in the process, which did not meet the um, April 8th deadline for, uh, for submission. And it was still reviewed within the, within the TAG meetings here the last uh, two weeks. And um, in, in further notice, uh, this is a topic that is being discussed and has been discussed for the last two sessions at the legislative level. Um, and I just want to add my support of the TAG committee to uh, disapprove. Thank you, Seth. Uh, Bruce, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Just very briefly, I, I just wanted to um, disagree with the comment that this is a needed belt and suspenders proposal. Um, belt and suspender proposals are exactly what we don't need because it just simply complicates the EPD submittal process and the reduction processes that any of these industries or projects would be going through. Um, belt and suspenders would be 
uh, qualify under redundant unnecessarily and unnecessarily increase the cost of construction per the RCW. So I don't think it's really going to be the, the tag or the, or the BFP's role to create a redundant process um, that is characterized as belt and suspenders. It's not a primary process. If it's simply a backup secondary process, I don't think we need it. And I don't think it's the role of this committee. Thank you. Larry, go ahead. Yeah, one last thing. The, the codes used to be a code of safety, okay? And now we're getting codes that that do so much that has nothing to do with safety. And it, it's, it's being expanded at such a rate that um, it's, it's ridiculous. And, and we're, we're just pricing people out of homes and buildings. And we, I had four projects lately that got turned down because the, the, the funding is gone. And, and, and that isn't right. I mean, we're, we're making it unaffordable now with all these other things that are being tacked on. Thank you. Okay, uh, with that, we'll move it back to our uh, committee members. Is there anything that committee members would like to add to this? Todd, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I'll, I'll add a little more on these two proposals. Um, you know, I think our challenge as building code council members um, is to, you know, support our staff who I want to, want to reinforce, you know, did an uh, outstanding process. You know, the process worked on, on these two proposals as intended. The challenge we always have as, as members or for the staff is to communicate process at the same time we're trying to do the technical work. So the technical advisory group is the stakeholder level where we're trying to inform the, the council as with rulemaking authority, again, granted by the legislature. So there were a lot of challenges at the TAG level about process while we were trying to do the technical work to inform the process by the staff and the council, again, so that we can best inform you know, the legislative process. So um, I wanna, you know, in this, I abstained from a vote in my role as a chair. I also wanted to make sure there was no perception since I am in the timber industry uh, regarding these two materials. But I will say these proposals have merit somewhere. And if there's a question to the council, it's, it's, it's to help guide where that merit belongs. Does it belong in the, in, in the council with legislative mandate um, so that we should continue to inform what that could look like in, the, in, in, the, in, the, in this case, the building code? Um, or does it belong at the legislative process with more policy development? Either way, I'm, I'm proud of the work that all stakeholders did on this, that staff did on this to inform either that council level or the legislature level, um, you know, policy or code development. So I want to thank the proponent in, in, in particular to for bringing these forward and working through the process with me. I think everyone had education in this and um, I think um, really leave it to the committee now. And that was the intent to push this to the committee for guidance so that we have um, have it at the level of, of, of appointed council members to be guiding us whether this belongs in the you know, moving forward to the council level. So thank you. Thank you, Todd. And thank you to uh, the tag members that also went through this process. Uh, Roger, go ahead. Yeah, I, I just wanted to respond. I, I agree with Todd completely. I thought it was a very good process to <clears throat> discuss uh, originally two proposals that were controversial. Um, you know, there was the, the there was question at the tag whether the um, modified proposal that added wood was was a valid from a procedural standpoint or not, but there was a very good discussion about that. Um, I, I do I respect what the the vote of the on the tag. Um, I want to make a couple of uh, opinions note uh, noted 
Um, number one, the purpose of the building code is to protect the health and safety of the public. And I think limit, limiting the amount of embodied carbon um, that goes into our buildings most definitely is uh, protecting the health and, health and safety of the public, uh, in my opinion. The original proposals that came in had both a reporting component as well as a limit component. So you had to meet limits, uh, the amount of carbon that was going into your material. Um, through the process, all of those limits were eliminated. So it became only, only a reporting, um, a requirement that the carbon footprint, the carbon in the, the various materials uh, needed to be reported. Um, so this, the modified proposal was not a buy clean proposal. It said nothing about the limits on the, on the, um, of carbon. And it also was not what was included in the legislature. Uh, it became a very simple thou shalt report. Um, the changes also that were proposed limited the requirements of the building official to only receive a letter saying, yes, these have been reported. So the, um, the design professional needed to submit a letter saying, yes, these, uh, the, the EPDs were provided. That was it. So the demand on the building official was very, very insignificant. So having said that, I agree with Todd. I think um, uh, we need as an industry to reduce the amount of carbon that goes into our buildings. Um, that That is 11% of the, the uh, global, the greenhouse gases uh, emissions around the globe are embodied carbon that goes into buildings. Um, so we need to address that. I believe personally that, that there is a um, place for that in the building code, um, but um, you know, ultimately uh, it's, it's up to the remaining members of this committee and, um, and, and the process as to whether that moves forward now or whether the proposals that were provided um, need to be reworked, need to be, um, you know, worked with uh, all of the stakeholders um, and, and come back to us at the at the next um, code cycle. So that's all I've got to say. Thank you, Roger. Micah, go ahead. Thanks, Tony. Uh, I appreciate everybody's work on this. I know it is a proposal that has tried to go through the legislature, but is now being tried to put in code, um, which in my opinion is the correct path. Um, I've mentioned it before, you know, legislators are, are extremely valuable individuals. However, they should not be writing construction codes to some extent and putting that in law. We're seeing that issue with the wildland urban interface code and the problems with trying to enforce what they put into an RCW currently. So we, we want to move away from that. And so this is the right process. However, However much we want this, this is a regulation or a reporting of a product. Products should be, in my opinion, and are regulated by the Department of, excuse me, the Department of Commerce. This should not be in the building code. This should be a rule done and adopted by the Department of Commerce, not through legislators, not through the building code, Department of Commerce. Uh, I'm not opposed to the proposal. It's just in the wrong location. So if we need to go support it through the, the Department of Commerce, we can do that. And, you know, part of the process was mentioned. That's what the technical advisory group is for. They're advising on technical language. I believe the added of timber, mass timber, something else, some type of wood to the proposal was part of the discussion that was brought up. And so the proponent brought back some language that was previously prepared that said, yeah, we we understand that here's some language that you may want to look at if you're going to move this forward and had questions through the through the tag process that's what this process is for um again just not the right place for it but i appreciate the hard work on these proposals as well as all the others thanks thank you michael any other comments from committee members okay with that um Stoyan, is the best route to go is to take committee action on IBC structural separate from the IEBC? Yes. Okay. All right. So right now we're looking for um, committee action to, for a recommendation to council. 
the committee action could be uh, repeating uh, the TAC recommendation or we can do agree with TAC recommendation. Understood. It's Thank the you. same goal, different wording. Thank you. Uh, Michael, go ahead. I'll make the motion to accept the TAG recommendation for moving these proposals forward as shown on the screen from the TAG. Thank you, Micah. Corey? This is Corey, I second that motion. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Okay, um, let's do a roll call on this. Give me a second. Sorry. Corey? Aye. Todd? Aye. Micah? Aye. Diamond? Aye. Robert? Aye. Roger? Aye. Motion carries. Okay. Motion passes with six. I votes. Okay, let's move. Um, uh, Micah, go ahead. Sorry, I, I don't mean to interrupt, but I, I would like to provide some information again to the to the items that were disapproved, um, and further the process that maybe folks don't know about that are on the call. We will have two public comment meetings coming this fall, so if you feel that this recommendation is incorrect, or you would still like to provide modifications to your proposals. You can do that at that time, is my understanding. And Storian can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we should let folks know that um, that there's still additional steps in the process that they can take furthering their proposals. The next step, the next step is a council meeting on Friday, uh, and uh, when the council makes the decision to include uh, language and proposals in the CR 102. Then when we get to the comment period and the testimony, uh, these are uh, testimony based on the submitted uh, language, submitted proposals, part of the CR 102. So we cannot add additional proposals. We can with off cycle rulemaking, but not, if it's not proposed in the CR 102, then it cannot be added further. We, we learned this the hard way. Uh, we were trying to submit something uh, uh, for the fire court and the court revisor's office just rejected it. So again, whatever it's in the CR 102, we can withdraw from the CR 102, but we cannot add a section that wasn't initially proposed. Michael, go ahead. I'm not asking about adding, but can those sections be modified through public comment as we have before? If, That's the point if, of yes, if the sections are proposed in the CR 102, yes, they can be further modified. Yes, sorry, I didn't understand the, the statement. Thank you, Mike, and thank you, Storian, for that clarification. Uh, Rachel? Yeah, I have a process clarification question. Thank you for asking that, Micah. That is something that I know several of us are curious about. When will Friday's meeting details be posted? And what time is that meeting? There's nothing that I'm seeing about that. You don't see anything, but you see links to the BFP and uh, MVE uh, committees uh, today. And you don't see anything on uh, the council meeting webpage because we don't have the decisions today. So after, after we have the decisions today, then we can post documents. Uh, but now you have links and the documents that are posted for the BFP and the MVE committee, they will be the same documents with, with a few modifications. Okay, so Stoyan, it, it will be posted today then. So let me let me show what we have. Stoyan, will it be posted today? Here it is. So when, when we get to the council meeting, you don't see anything, right? However, when you click on the links, it will show you the documents. And these are the same documents that will be discussed at the council meeting on Friday. If 
after today's meetings, all these documents as modified, if there are modifications, will be posted on the council meeting webpage. Today, later this afternoon. Thank you, Stoya. Rachel, does that clear that up? Thank you. Thank you. Bruce, go ahead. Bruce, go ahead. Sorry, I'm on my again, I'm on my phone in a semi -noise, noisy area. If you could, Storian, would you do me a favor, please? Could you summarize the the motion and the vote that was just taken, please? I, well, I don't know that I got it 100%. We have technical advisory group recommendation and the committee action was to accept the technical advisory group recommendation and move it to the council for a uh, decision. Okay, to accept. Okay, BFP accepts and they can still move to the council. And that vote was? Six to zero. Six to zero, okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. With that, we will move on to the um, existing building code. Here is the existing building code on the screen. We have all proposals approved or approved as modified. Only one was withdrawn by the proponent. And if it's withdrawn, no further action is needed. Okay, excellent. And uh, do we have a is, is a, is an overview needed? Uh, this is Todd. I, I would just say, um, you know, great process and very competent proposals. So I, I think the TAG stands by these, these recommendations. Excellent, thank you, Todd. Any uh, questions or comments from the committee members? Okay, this is a, a public comment item. Is there anyone from the public that would like to speak? Okay, with that, we'll look, be looking to go through the same process as the one previous, and we're looking for a motion to approve as recommended by the TAG or approve with modifications to send to the council for council action on Friday. Um, Tony, I will make a motion that we uh, approve the, the uh, list as shown um, <coughs> as the approve the recommendations of the TAG. Thank you, Roger. This is Bob Hamlin. I'll second that. Thank you, Bob. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion on this? Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. Any against? Okay. Motion carries. So with that, we will go to the IRC, the residential code. Okay, and is there anyone who wants to give us an overview on this? Micah, go ahead. As I was the chair, I'm sure I could do that. Perfect. <laughs> Uh, again, similar to what Todd mentioned, a, a robust process getting through some of these. We went through several meetings and made some modifications to almost every proposal. Unfortunately, some of them were disapproved, and I know that um, we would like to talk about some of those. I think some of the proponents are on here. Of course, one that I have that I will come back after others have spoken on, um, not that I have, that that was part of the Washington Association of Building Officials um, set of proposals. We'd like to talk about that again to see if we can change the um, mind of the committee on one of those proposals. But again, great proposals, a lot of good work. Um, and so I appreciate everybody's time on that. I do have some opinions on some of these. Um, of course, as the chair, I did not vote at the, at the uh, tag meetings unless there was a tie. We didn't have any of those ties. So um, I still have some opinions on these proposals that um, 
maybe we could talk through, but I want to give time to those folks that have proposals that were either modified or disapproved either way, if they want to make some testimony to the BFP to kind of change the minds, I will let Tony guide that process. Thanks, Tony. And uh, I want to add, um, you, you see the notes right here and, and uh, I already mentioned that these notes are for staff to consider, but you know, I intentionally have the notes here. Again, this is a working document and you can, looking at the notes, you can uh, uh, kind of figure out what was the process and, and what was going on. And for, for example, the first proposal, it was proposed and then, uh, you know, there was a recommendation by the technical advisory group for the proponent to modify the proposal so that the proposal was modified and further discussed. So, you know, again, looking at the notes, you will get, you, you will have some idea what was going on with each particular proposal. Thank you, Sian. Before we open it up to public comment, is there anything else from committee members? Okay, and with that, we'll open it up for public comment. And I don't have a name on the screen, so I apologize, but someone has their hand up. Go ahead. Yes, this is Ted Clifton, and I did send in uh, some written commentary, but uh, basically I'm addressing proposal 091 about charging cars. Uh, uh, introduce myself first, and sorry that my name doesn't appear on the screen. I don't know how to correct that. I'm Ted Clifton. I uh, reside and work in Coopville, Washington for 32 years. I design and build zero energy homes, homes that also power the electric cars. Uh, I'm a huge fan of EVs. I support their use and adoption by the general public. I believe there will be at least one in every garage within five years. And you're gonna be hard pressed to find any but specialty vehicles running on gas or diesel by 2030. This will not be because the law requires it. It will be cut because of consumer choice. I've been driving an EV, Tesla Model 3, for four years. Both my sons drive EVs. One's a Tesla Model S and the other's a S Tesla Model 3 four-wheel drive. My daughter-in-law has been driving a Nissan Leaf on her third now for a total of nine years. So I know quite a bit about these vehicles. Any of these vehicles can be charged fully during the overnight hours, allowing for an eight-hour workday, one-hour commute each way, enough to drive more than 40 miles each way each day using a 120 volt 15 amp connection. My long range model three will go more than 112 miles on a 14 hour charge using the standard household outlet. At our current Western Washington electricity rates, it would cost about $2.50 per day to charge enough to drive 112 miles. My younger son's four-wheel drive Model 3 is charged daily at his condo using a standard outlet in his entryway with an extension cord running out underneath his front door. He commutes daily from Kent to Boeing in Seattle and has never run short of charge. In fact, by the weekend, his car is always fully charged and ready to go on a longer trip, which he regularly does to his girlfriend's parents' home in Spokane. While the 240 volt 40 amp receptacle is the preferred method of charging for most of my luxury home clients. We most often have been installing a 240 volt 30 amp receptacle as it costs less than half that of the 40 amp installation and is much more than plenty to charge fully from a nearly depleted, nearly depleted battery to a full charge overnight. When a 120 volt 15 amp receptacle is clearly enough to do the job for most people, requiring by code, the 240 volt 40 amp charging circuit would be like requiring every bathroom in every house to be a minimum of 213 square feet. When we know from years of experience that a 40 square foot, five foot by eight foot bathroom can hold a tub, shower, toilet, and 36 inch vanity just fine. To support this overreach of code is to help perpetuate the myth that EVs are difficult to charge, that they require massive amounts of power, and that they require expensive equipment in the home to make them work. Nothing could be further from the truth. 
what is much more important than the extra voltage and amperage is to have a dedicated circuit for each EV. This allows each to charge fully without having to wait for another user of electricity to finish. We don't need to be making trips to the garage to change from one car to the other at two o'clock in the morning. So I strongly recommend the following three changes. Number one, reduce the required voltage and amperage to 120 volt, 15 amp dedicated circuit. Number two, require one for each vehicle stall, not just one per garage or carport. And number three, require these in each wired garage or carport, not just attached. If you can run a wire for a light or a garage door opener, you can run an additional 14-2 wire for a car charger at very low cost and serve the needs of the public much, much better long into the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there any further public comment? Micah, go ahead. Would we be taking public comment on this proposal or all proposals, Tony? Um, I'm opening it up for all. If someone wants to jump on to that one, they can. And Micah, if you have any comments or any committee members have comments on um, or during the public comment process, feel free to raise your hand. Um, okay. <laughs> um, on that proposal, I. I'm still torn on that proposal. I was not able to vote. I probably would have voted against that proposal. Again, um, the EV charging in the building code was legislative driven. Um, that's why that language is there. There was a modification. And yes, we all understand. We've heard through the meetings, through the SBCC meetings, that the intent of the legislation was to include one and two family dwellings. However, that was not stated in the legislation. And all they did was remove an occupancy classification type from the building code. And that occupancy classification type does not exist in the one and two family dwelling code. So I, I, again, I'm kind of torn on, on the code language for the EV charging. It's not something that um, I think should be in the building code, but again, I don't believe the legislators should be writing it either. Um, and until there's a legislative mandate to require it, in one and two family dwellings, I don't think the SBCC should be moving this proposal forward. And I know I'll get pushed back on that. Um, and then I also would like to talk about proposal 043, the revised proposal on common shared spaces and their separation. And we'd like to discuss possibly getting the committee to change their recommendation on this. They're, I believe at the tag, there was just some confusion on this proposal and what it would allow. This is indicating some guidance on shared common accessory areas in two family dwellings. Let's just give it as a two family dwelling. Um, you could have a shared garage and currently there are separation requirements for that shared garage. But if you have any other type of space, say you're sharing a laundry room, there's no guidance in the code that says what you what your separation should be in that shared laundry room. It only provides guidance for garages. So is what this proposal does is provide that guidance on those shared accessory spaces that's not a garage. The table is very similar to the garage table. In other words, if you allow a, a um, half hour or this, you know, the the gypsum that's in the table for a garage, why would you not allow that for a shared laundry space? Again, there was no guidance in the code and that's what this proposal does. Um, the big concern that I remember from the tag is, well, can you use it for habitable space? Well, that's up for interpretation. Um, you could do that now. However, what we provided in this code change proposal under the first paragraph, last sentence, for this change, such shared accessory room shall not include habitable space. So this won't include that habitable space. You can't go in and put an Airbnb in this shared common room, or you can't use it for sleeping purposes, uh, anything like that. This is 
providing guidance for things like laundry rooms, storage rooms, other things that are not a garage. So we do want to encourage that the BFP reconsider this proposal and change the tag recommendation for moving forward. Thank you. And maybe some others on here may have some comments on this modification. Thank you, Micah. Um, Damon, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'd like to go back to uh, the EV charging infrastructure. Um, there were two proposals put forward. You can see the second one on the on the screen was a uh, was disapproved. It was essentially taking the commercial code language and talking about parking spaces and you know all, all th things that didn't really apply to residential. Um, I'm one that has has uh, routinely in, uh, included these circuits in the homes I build, uh, but mo most of the homes I build are more luxury homes, as Ted mentioned. Um, I didn't think when this proposal came out, it was so simple. I thought, you know, this is something we could support, but I didn't realize that uh, your standard 15 amp or 20 amp circuit was adequate to charge a car for daily use. And clearly we already put uh, outlets in garages. So we've already got the infrastructure to charge cars. And I'm leaning toward Micah's comments uh, that this probably the code isn't probably the, the, the place to put this forward. Um, so I would recommend that that this committee disapprove uh, 090. Thank you. Thank you, Damon. Larry, go ahead. You know, we're a proponent for energy efficiency, but there is a cost factor here. And um, my my own company's trying to buy a new truck, medium sized truck, and I went to the Freightliner dealer. And the, the diesel truck was ninety thousand dollars, and we're we're possibly maybe going to maybe a natural gas motor, but that's another fifty thousand dollars. But the electric truck um, was two hundred and seventy thousand dollars, and as a small business, I can't afford that. And the same thing is with the electric car. I mean, we got kids and families out here. They need a new car for $20,000. Well, the batteries in these cars cost $18,000. And so people that have make really good money, I encourage them to get these cars. But we got to look at what the average person or family or the low income people, what can they do? And, and that's where I see the real problem. I mean, all the garages, I, I think, are required to have a 20 amp outlet already in there. So, so, so they already have the 20 amp outlet. But uh, so it's, it's the cost of this stuff is, is what's killing us right now. And, and where I live, I'm in a lower district here. I have my business in here. And, uh, and I see the hardships these people are going through. And um, and they they don't have the money to do these kind of things. I'm I'm sorry, but they just don't have the money to do it. Thank you, Chris. Go ahead. Hi, Chris Edmark, Durston County. Um, some of my is a question. Um, on this, the deconstruction. Uh, proposal and uh, the construction and demolition management. Why is why is this a something that the building code or the residential code has to, as the building official, be involved with? Um, on the uh, construction management and, and de uh, of materials and things like that. I'm going to get a report. What am I going to do with it? Am I really going to just take in a piece of paper, make sure I get a piece of paper before they issue the building permit and get a piece of paper after they get the building permit? I, I wasn't part of the tag. I didn't listen to the tag discussion on it. And I'm just kind of curious as to what the real intent was this one. And then I have comments on two other proposals, but I'd like to do them one at a time. Can you help me out? Yes, Chris. If, um, do any of your 
comments right now have to do with, with the electric charging? Yes, I'm going to agree with Micah on the first proposal that was disapproved. I don't believe it belongs in the building code. The second proposal to provide a, a circuit, I think that that's probably okay. But again, this kind of information should be in the electric code because as a county, we don't enforce the electric code. And we're now expected to, as building inspectors that have no idea what the code, electric code is about, again, check for things. Thanks on that one. Maybe we can come back to the other one. Um, it's just starting to get a little clunky because we're jumping around and we still have Micah's to kind of discuss also. So Chris, I'll come back to you. Um, Wonderful. And, and Ted, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, just one quick, uh, comment. I, I, I agree with Larry right now about the cost of the uh, electric vehicles and especially the trucks. But what you're seeing is a, a new market where we haven't been around long enough with these vehicles to have a, a robust used car market. And when that robust used car market develops, you're actually going to be able to buy any of these cars for five, six thousand dollars where they'd be comparable to a 10 year old Honda or something like that. So um, we're, we're in a new market. We just have to understand that the house is going to last a couple hundred years, maybe, uh, and we have to be uh, uh, able to charge these cars. And uh, Kathleen? Hi, I thank you everybody for your comments. I uh, greatly appreciate them and everybody's consideration. I was the proponent of the EV charging uh, proposal. And just like to keep in mind that Washington is a zero emission state. Uh, the governor is, uh, the goal is 100% EV sales, EV registrations by 2030. It's a very short time period. We need the infrastructure. And with respect to the amperage of the 40 amp, to that, that is where most codes land because to do, uh, to put something in the code that technically can't be easily modified, what do you do for those locations where 15 uh, amperes is, is, is going to suffice? So that's that's why we landed at the 40. Uh, if, the, if the committee feels uh, it's appropriate to modify, then please do. But, you know, again, to, to I believe it was Ted's comment with respect to the secondary market, uh, that is definitely an equity component, making sure that folks have access to charging stations for when, when they, they have the opportunity to purchase uh, EVs. And so, but uh, just appreciate the comments. Another quick question uh, or, or comment uh, with respect to the construction and demolition material management. Uh, in Seattle, we found that those documents were incredibly uh, helpful with respect to understanding where our materials, our CND materials were going, um, how to maximize end use markets. So if it's an optional appendix, if your jurisdiction opts to utilize that, and that may be information you want to gather. Also, you know, it, it, the, the code's original intent is for life and safety. You know, energy moved in and, and, and we're really dealing with carbon emission issues and, and buildings are 40% of that. So it's something that I don't think that we as a, a community of, of professionals can um, dismiss. And so we do have some responsibility. And so um, just ask your consideration on that as well. Thank you. Thank you for the clarification on that, Kathleen. Um, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna, limit public comment just to the um, electrical vehicle charging for now. We're going to try and get through that one. So Larry, go ahead. One final comment is the other thing that we haven't discussed here so far today is the power requirements that's going to be required. I mean, we're just running calculations right now. Every year that we put these new homes in with all electric, we need to use a dam the size of Little Goose Dam one and a half times to power all this electricity. And then on our cars and our trucks and everything, if you look at all the power lines that you got out there and all the gas lines in our area, in the Avista area, to make everybody go electric with their vehicles, we have to have that much more power than, than what we have now. So all the electric 
and all the gas, we got to have, we have to double that to take care of the cars and the vehicles and the trucks. And, and, and we don't have it. I mean, we aren't even close to it. And, and, and that's another thing that uh, maybe the 20 amp charger might be a good thing because it spans it out over a longer period of time. But the fact is we just don't have the power to do all this. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Go ahead, Damon. Um, I'd like to make a motion that the committee disapprove uh, 091 electric vehicle, electric vehicle supply equipment. This is Corey, I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion and a second. And for committee members, any further discussion? I'll, I'll discuss that a little bit for a moment. Um, I'm on the fence on it. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Chris did make a good point that needs to be considered about the electrical programs. For folks that may not be aware of that, the electrical code for the state is processed through labor and industries, not through the state building code council. And for jurisdictions that do not have their own electrical programs, these items wouldn't, the electrical items would not be captured um, by jurisdictions. They're, they don't look at the electrical. That's done through the state. And this is not in a state electrical code. It's not in the legislation anywhere. Um, that was one of the arguments, again, that was part of the building code when that was mandated to be put in the building code as well. So I, I agree with that comment. These just aren't going to be looked at in so many jurisdictions around the state. Um, or you're going to expect your building inspector, who's not an electrical inspector, to capture something in the residential code that he's technically not qualified for. Um, uh, I'm not sure if many folks are aware that in the state of Washington, to be an electrical inspector, you're required to be a journeyman electrician. If, and, and somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm almost certain that's the requirement. And so building inspectors normally are not journeyman electricians. So there is some concern there and we'll move on with uh, the vote on this motion. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. Corey, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just, one thing. So um, I put a 50 amp circuit in for my wife's electric vehicle and we do charge at night. So that takes away some of the power requirements. However, it's not mandated that um, citizens of Washington state have an electric vehicle. And I think this is just premature until we have, there's a cost impact to all this stuff. And what Larry pointed out about the additional electricity required for new heat pump heating requirements, there's going to be a larger burden and we need to take this incrementally. This is, in my opinion, just premature. I think we need to wait until we have the ability to produce a million electric vehicles before we start regulating what needs to be in a residential home. Um, because many cases you'd be providing this uh, uh, additional cost for no benefit whatsoever as you've got a couple gas vehicles in there. Thank you. Thank you, Corey. Todd, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Um, so Mike, I just wanna make sure I understand during the TAG process, this you were discussing that in the IBC, this was considered under legislative mandate. Was that discussed thoroughly at the TAG level? And, and did everyone understand the difference between that mandate versus the process in the IRC? You know, I honestly don't know if everybody thoroughly understood that. Um, so maybe not. <laughs> um, okay. And, but, but that uh, is, this is the proposal you were discussing, right? About Yes. Um, and I had, you know, several opinions on it again, where, where some of this is, is not part of that legislative mandate. Um, and there's some argument there on, on, well, that was the intent. We understand that was the intent, but that's not what was put into the legislation. Uh, again, that legislation is geared towards the building code, not the residential code. And um, moving an occupancy classification, which doesn't exist in the residential code, doesn't mean you're going to be told to put it in the residential code. So uh, again, I, 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 I'm really torn because this is the process to get stuff in code language. Um, provided by legislative mandate. However, this was not legislatively mandated. So I, I think it's just a, a step too far. And I have my concerns, you know, we're picking one technology. We're not taking into account others. I know Andrew Klein, our previous chair, 
mentioned a lot about hydrogen um, and hydrogen engines. I know that there are lots of companies going, you know, exploring that as well. So I, I'm really torn on this, <laughs> but I'm not sure if that was clear to everyone, Todd. So thanks for asking that. Thank you, Todd. Micah, Roger, go ahead. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> well, I was just, number one, I would like a little bit of clarification. I think that the motion is about um, 091, but there was discussion previously about revisiting um, 026. So I want a little bit of clarity on um, what we are voting on and, and you know, just the, the procedural, are we opening up 026 again, or are we just purely looking at uh, 091? And then I, I just wanted to comment on Micah's, um, I keep going, you know, there's conversations about both uh, this particular uh, proposal as well as the, um, the EPD proposals and about whether, uh, you know, there's a comment made previously that the changes to the building code should come through the building council, not through legislatures, which I agree with that. We're the ones that are trying to figure out a building code. Um, legislatures are not necessarily. Um, yet the, the hesitation to approve this one is because it's not legislated and that the legislation that was passed for commercial, even though the intent may have been for single family residents, we're going to not do it because the, it wasn't legislated. So um, I, I kind of feel like the, the decision of whether or not this should be approved is whether it um, makes sense moving forward. And, and I think uh, we are good, bad, or indifferent. The, the direction of, um, of the state of Washington is towards electric vehicles. And I, you know, these, these codes, this is gonna be adopted in summer of 23. Um, you know, we aren't have, gonna have another code until 27 or 28, and we're supposed to be um, ready to have significant more electric vehicles in by 2030. So I think doing what we can now to prepare our, our new houses and our new structures uh, for that inevitable change is something that we as a building code should do, so. Roger, thank you for those comments. And just to start off here with, and uh, make sure that we <clears throat> are clear and answering questions for Roger and other committee members. Damon, can you please uh, clarify your motion? Yes, uh, my motion is to disapprove 091 as recommended by the TAG. Okay, thank you, Damon. Um, Corey, go ahead. Um, Mr. Chair, if you could let Todd speak, he, I think he was trying before and I just jumped back on to rebuttal, please. Oh, no. Okay. Well, I have a quick one. Thank you, Corey. Um, you know, when we're looking at 091 and, and particularly um, 026, you know, in general, I'm in support that we, we do need to move this infrastructure forward. Um, where I get hung up from a development code standpoint uh, in, in other roles is where our development codes are over um, specifying over acquiring parking stalls on EDUs and so forth. So the development codes are, are moving away from those required stall, you know, parking. And by saying that if there's required parking, we have to put this infrastructure in place, we are, you know, working against um, a lot of our, our um, responses to, 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 you know, our housing needs. So just, that's one of my concerns right now is tying those two things too closely together, the development codes and the, and the building and the residential code. Thank you, Todd. Corey, go ahead. So again, for me, it's more about we're, we're moving forward too fast. I think there will be a change. I think hydrogen vehicles are going to be impact. Part of this whole thing is getting away from gasoline vehicles, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be electrical. And if we make a rule where they've got to supply a 40 amp circuit, um, I just think we're, we're putting uh, the cart before the horse. I think we, we need, we have time and these are three year cycles. And I think waiting three years to see what happens with all the other requirements that are going to be a burden to the electrical system is an important thing to think about. And so, um, I just, the idea that it's because of legislation isn't, isn't my thought here. I just think we're too, we're moving too fast because if 
more vehicles come out for hydrogen um, than we've spent all the money on a 40 amp circuit that we don't need. And there are ways to cha charge the car on just a typical outlet in the house um, that's already gonna be provided for, especially if it has a garage. And so part of the reason the building code needed to change it is the expense of dealing with buildings. These are much larger systems and they're much more expensive to put in. If we don't prepare for those future systems to be there uh, in parking lots, that's why they did it. And the residential part of it, I think, is just a little bit too soon. Thank you, Corey. Micah, go ahead. Thanks again, Tony. I just want to kind of respond to Roger a little bit on the, I, the building code process. That was legislatively mandated, and they did write code in that legislation, unfortunately. The State Building Code Council actually had to go above and beyond, which was allowed by legislation, in the code language in order to make it enforceable. Um, I did vote against that proposal. Uh, the legislation had exceptions in there for, I believe it was like um, A, B, and M occupancies, where you would only provide EV parking where employee parking was provided. Um, that's not enforced in the building code. The, the code officials don't ask for that. There's, there's no way to capture that number. Uh, so we, so the building code, the SBCC did go above and beyond so we could have language that was somewhat enforceable. Um, again, that legislative mandate that I talk about should be provided in language that just says, go provide this in the building code. Don't write it and tell us how to do that. Um, the last change from the legislature that occurred as they took out the occupancy classification R3. A lot of people said, well, the intent of that is to capture one and two family dwellings, but R3s don't exist in the residential code. So it, it was, yes, I'm saying legislative mandate, but really the legislative mandate needs to say, we want these in one and two family dwellings, go put that in the building code. Um, and, and the building code item that we approved, again, in my opinion, was modified so heavily that it's still put in stuff that's not enforceable or won't be looked at based on the electrical requirements for jurisdictions that don't do electrical inspections. So I, I, it was a whole problem all the way through and I didn't vote for it then either, Roger. So just want to provide some clarification on what I meant by legislatively mandated. It just needs to say, hey, go do this. And, and then we provide language. But again, this item, I think, is just not needed in the residential code at this time. Mr. Chair, am I allowed to make a comment? Go ahead, sorry. Uh, regarding the legislature, uh, just to clarify the language. So uh, there were requirements for electric vehicle charging uh, and there was an exception for R3 occupants. And this exception was taken, taken off. And, you know, we had a long discussion whether or not the Senate wanted to require a one and two family dwellings. There is a different reading in this. Uh, and the different reading is, R3 was exempt, but one and two family dwelling, there wasn't exception for that. So, you know, when we're talking about the legislature, it just, if 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 it, it's not considered for this decision, my recommendation is just keep it on the technical, uh, on the technical side. And this was the clarification. And the comment I want to make is, um, and I've made it before, uh, and you know, my background is in California and I, I don't hide that. And I, 99% I, uh, I recommend just don't follow what California is, is doing. But California did a, a, a good job on this electric vehicle uh, uh, charging for one and two family dwelling. Uh, and in 2012, and I was part of the team that developed this language. And between 2012 and 2019, when I left the state of California, I haven't heard a single complaint about uh, 40 amp uh, receptacle outlets in, in a private garage, a single one. There were exceptions and I'm not aware of a single house that used uh, 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 that exception. And uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we, uh, you know, we have uh, an ex-official member from Labor and Industries uh, in the council. And I had a discussion with him, and I don't want to paraphrase his wording. He will attend the council meeting on Friday, but based on the conversation, my understanding is that most of the single-family dwellings currently in the state of Washington, they have 200 amp 
uh, uh, service. And uh, adding a 40 amp circuit won't change the 200 amp. And I did some calculations and I did the same calculations like nine, 10 years ago in California. And if you have everything electric in your house, including 40 amp in the garage, you will need to upgrade the panel for houses more than 3000 square feet. You know, it goes up and down, but most likely you will need to upgrade the panel, the service panel, bigger than 200 amp for expensive high-end houses. Uh, this, is, uh, this is my comment. Thank you, Stoyan. Uh, any further discussion on the motion that was made? Uh, Todd, go ahead. Yeah, I'm just I'm going back and forth between 026 and 091 and trying to better understand is 091 only for new new units, whereas 026 can include ADUs so forth? Uh, 091 is uh, for one and two family dwellings and uh, mm, one and two family dwellings with uh, attached garages and carports. It doesn't specify ADUs, and even with the ADU, it's a, it, it's a new unit. Uh, and and uh, 026 was going above and beyond that. So 026 was uh, addressing also townhouses uh, with on-site parking and uh, attached and detached garages. So that's the difference. There was a discussion about the ADUs, but I think Mike mentioned a few times that the ADU is not defined as a type of construction in the residential code. It's The ADU is a residential dwelling unit. Right, and that's my clarification is, is in 091, there is no reference to specific building typology that I can see. Is that a correct statement? I think it's a correct statement, yes. I And I will show a 91 on the screen right here. So provisions of this section shall apply to the construction of new, there is your answer for your question, dwelling units per section 1012. Okay. With attached private garages or attached private carports. Okay, what I want to make a clear distinction here is we're not conflicting with where our development codes are going in our major cities when we start to have more units per per parcels and so forth right is, is that we're not um, we're not tying those two things in and I don't see it in this 091 so I I, I, I would be opposed to this motion very soft up, up, up position here because I understand the, the strong arguments for, for why you're making this motion but uh, thank you for that clarification. Thank you. Any further discussion from committee members on the motion on the table? Okay, with that, let's go ahead and do a roll call. Cody? Aye. Todd? Uh, nay. Micah? Oh, uh, nay. Diamond? Aye. Robert? Bob Hamlin? We may have lost him because he said he had to leave after an hour. Uh, Roger? Sorry, nay. So we have two I and we have three nay. Okay, so motion fails. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we were in the middle of public comment, and I'd like to get, uh, Damon, go ahead. Just a uh, point of clarification, do, do we still have a quorum? Uh, yes, we do. Thank you, Damon. So we have currently one, two, three, four, five six uh, TAC members and we have a quorum. We, ne we need four for a quorum. Thank you, sir. Um, so with that, um, we need to address uh, uh, Micah's as well as Chris's. Chris, I know you, uh, there was a discussion about 
the appendix in the construction and demolition. Um, the, the fact that it's an appendix and a choice for the local authority having jurisdiction, did that clear up that for you, Chris? Yes. Okay, thank you. And Micah, would you like to touch on, um, go ahead, Micah. Yeah, thanks for bringing this one up again, Stoyan. Uh, again, I'm not sure this was the version that was looked at the tag meeting and I believe that last sentence was missing. Um, and that was the big concern about those spaces being um, used for habitable purposes. And that's not the intent here. So that's why that sentence is there in the last paragraph that these accessory spaces should not be not include habitable space. So you're not going to set up a big TV room for both units to use and, and, and share. This is, you know, laundry rooms, storage spaces, things like that. And it's going to provide guidance on that separation. So I really would um, urge the BFP to support this. Um, once we're kind of done with the public comment, I will make a motion as such, but um, th that's the reason I, I wanted to revisit this one is we wanted to capture this and we wanted to address the tags concerns and bring it back. So hopefully that does that. And I'd like to get some support for that. And I'll open up for comment further. Thanks. Thank you, Micah. Um, let's go ahead and open up to public comment uh, for, the, for the rest of the uh, IRC proposed changes. And Micah, now might be a good time for your motion, it sounds like. Yes, it will. <laughs> so I'd like to propose, uh, or excuse me, I'd like to make a motion that we approve for recommendation or recommend for approval uh, 043 revision and move that forward to the council, please. Okay, we have a motion on the table. I'll second that motion. Thank you, Roger. We have a second from Roger. And uh, let's open it up for discussion. Todd, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, Micah, you know, I'm, I'm not real familiar with these provisions, but can you help me understand why these are so prescriptive versus the rest of the chapter where I'm seeing is it's, it's often the, you know, a fire rating, a one hour fire resistance rating? Yeah, this was one of those areas where it wasn't, again, I mentioned earlier where you could have a common garage and this table is very similar to the common garage um, where you can provide these, these different, you know, it's an accessory space with minimal separation and that's allowed, but there was no guidance when these areas were not garages. Um, and so folks are going, you know, is your laundry room more of a risk, a common laundry room, more risk than a common garage? I would, in my opinion, I would say no, <laughs> um, stuff like that. So that's what this is. This is gonna provide guidance for some of that um, area. And maybe John can expand on that a little bit. John, go ahead. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I, uh, to respond to you, Todd, um, these are prescriptive because they don't have fire ratings, really. If a half inch wallboard isn't, isn't rated, uh, you might get a half hour out of it, but, um, and, and again, I think as Mike has said, we're trying to make these equivalent to garages, essentially. That's essentially what a garage requires. As opposed to a demising wall or, or something. So there is yes. a distinction in, okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay, any further discussion? Roger, go ahead. Uh, I wanna get clar clarification from uh, Micah about the sentence that was or was not added. Um, are we, I want to clarify the motion, are we um, approving the, um, what's on the screen or was there something that was a little bit different that, that did, there was supposed to be a sentence that got added? We're approving what's on the screen. Okay. Um, thank you. I don't, I don't, I don't have anything in addition to what you see on the screen. Uh, so I don't know if I missed that during the meeting or uh, I'm not sure. It, it may have been overlooked and John may have that answer. <laughs> uh, I, I think it was just that that uh, Michael was, uh, I don't know what you were showing before uh, Stoyan because I wasn't, I'm not sure, but it's possible you were showing the, the earlier version that did not have that 
when you first pulled it up on the screen. Uh, this is the revised version, and I yes. checked it's the working document that I I was modifying during the meeting, and I didn't see this senten sentence either. So I'm I'm not. Uh, no, no, I I think that the sentence is the one that's there, the shared accessory rooms. That's at the end of R three o two point three point three. It is the one that uh, um, Micah was referring to, and so I I don't remember what you were showing earlier. So. Okay. So this is the correct version that's on the screen to answer Roger's question. And okay. that's what we'd be voting to support uh, an approval on moving forward to the full council. Okay. And uh, there may be some need of renumbering, but that that's, that's editorial. So staff will take care of it. Okay. Any further discussion? Okay, with that, we'll take a roll call vote, please. Could you restate the motion, please? Yes. Uh, please. Go ahead. The motion will be to approve for recommend, or recommend for approval. I keep getting that backwards. Recommend for approval 043R. Thank you. Did I? Can we, get a, can we get a roll call? Yes, sir. Corey? Aye. Todd? Aye. Micah? Aye. Diamond? Aye. Uh, Roger? Aye. Okay. okay, one, two, three, four, five. Motion carries five, zero. Okay, what's right. next? Excellent, so let's open it up to public comment um, for anything remaining that we have not taken motion. Go ahead, Todd. Uh, thank you, Chair. I just wanna clarify a story in that the, rec the motion was recommend approval as modified. So it's 043R, just to make sure that's documented. Yeah, that's a document that 043R was the uh, version that the technical advisory group uh, yeah, uh, disapproved. Just, just the terminology in terms of when we see recommend yeah, okay. approve as modified or however it's appropriate to document that. Thank you, Sian. Okay, is there any other uh, public comment on the uh, proposals in front of us? Okay, is there any other uh, committee comment on the remaining proposals? Okay, with that, we need a motion to move things along. Go ahead, Corey. I'll make a motion to move the IRC code change proposals forward to the council as modified. Thank you, Corey. I will second. Thank you, Micah. We have a, a motion and a second. Any discussion? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, any against? And motion carries, thank you. With that, it looks like it's Corey's turn. <laughs> Going to the plumbing code. Finally, something fun. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Corey, if you wanna give us a quick breakdown of what we have here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'd like to say it was a robust and in-depth thing, but it's it was just plumbing and it went pretty quick. Um, we had six proposals. Um, the proposals we had the most discussion about were regarding um, some of the appendixes. Um, there was an issue, the discharge piping to start it off with, uh, one of the Bellevue inspectors found that he kept finding flexes 
for the temperature and pressure relief valves on water heaters and uh, people would reuse them or they would get kinked. And if they're kinked, they don't, they don't do what they're supposed to do and it's, it's more of a safety issue. And so um, he had a proposal to clean up the language in that section to make sure that it's uh, rigid piping. And so that those, that discharge piping cannot be kinked or restricted in any way. Um, so that went through. Um, we had a lot of discussion on Appendix M for a peak water demand calculator. And this was through some discussion with the energy code as well. Um, this is an optional uh, way to size water pipe for multifamily buildings. And there was a lot of discussion with that. One of the inspectors was a little leery of, of using a new appendix um, because the appendix that we use for years and years works. Um, but the committee found merit. And again, um, I was chair of the tag and, and didn't have a vote to say in it. it. It was overwhelmingly approved to add it so that there was that option for multifamily piping. Um, the next two appendixes were disapproved after discussion. And again, we spent most of the time discussing these appendixes. Um, there was a proposal to add air admittance valves to the body of the code and um, that was overwhelmingly uh, opposed. Uh, they still can do it through uh, uh, means and methods. And so it's still um, able to be used. Part of the discussion was just the burden for means and methods because if you get a whole bunch of those documents, it wears down the, um, the office doing the inspections. But um, ultimately that was disapproved. And then the secondary roof drain sizing was brought forward because um, weather patterns have changed in Seattle. We're not seeing, for years, we used to see long um, rounds of like weeks of drizzle for water. We'd have that light rainfall for weeks on end. We're seeing a lot more increased rainfalls in a short amount of time. And so the recommendation for this proposal, this proposal was recommending that we, uh, oversize the overflow roof drains to two times the volume of water required on the appendix when you, or the chart when you size roof drains. If um, you're sized for, let's just say a set of three inch roof drains, a three inch roof drain and a three inch overflow, um, you would double the rainfall amount for the overflow and perhaps upsize the overflow to four inch. This will allow for, um, that additional rainfall should it come. And um, that was approved um, as well. And that was the basic rundown. Thank you, Corey. Any questions or comments from uh, committee members? Okay, this is a public comment item. Is there any public comment on the proposals? John, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to add to Corey. Thank you, Corey, for uh, summarizing the last one there. Uh, that was uh, my proposal. And uh, the, just to add to that, um, the double the rainfall uh, um, requirement also is uh, in the structural code uh, in the uh, ASCE 7. So this essentially aligns the two codes. Thank you for the clarification, John. Appreciate it. Micah, go ahead. Thank you, and I appreciate Corey's work on all that as well. Um, as you see on there, one of the proposals has my name on it and the air admittance valves. What this proposal did was going to allow them outright in the code. What Corey mentioned about alternative means and methods is they're allowed, most any product can be allowed through an alternative means and method process. The concern for code officials is the number. So if you have a, say you have a, a, a subdivision come in and has 150 homes and they want to put in an air admittance valve say under the island sink what Corey or what is currently required not Corey I'm not gonna blame you Corey <laughs> uh, sorry about that um, what is indicated is that if that developer wanted to use that air admittance valve in those 150 homes they would have to provide a 150 separate alternative means and methods requests for one product. And what this did was um, put that in the body of the code. King County and uh, Seattle allow this in their code outright. And so 
the unfortunate side of us, yes, the tag voted it down, but I had asked the tag if there was recommendations for them to approve it, even putting it in an appendix. And so, uh, you know, then they said no, which I thought was very unfortunate. It provides language guidance on how to provide these if your jurisdiction wants to. So I, I would like to reopen that for discussion and maybe the BFP can consider putting it in the body of the code. And if they don't like that, maybe you can make it an appendix. Just take that language and provide it an appendix. That way, if a jurisdiction wants to approve this appendix on their own and then have that standardized code language for consistent enforcement, then they can have that without having to go through and provide all you know alternate means and methods for every time someone wants to use this. And if folks aren't aware of what a, an air admittance valve is, I'm not a plumber. It's literally a, a one-way valve that goes on the top of a vent stack, interior of the structure. It doesn't have to vent through the roof. However, part of this language still requires that your structure provide one vent through the roof. So it, it's not a giveaway to every vent can be an air admittance valve, but it is an allowance. So again, I'd, I'd like to revisit this and possibly if the BFP doesn't wanna put it in the body of the code, put it as an appendix, that way there's standard language available or put it in an appendix. So there's standard language available for a jurisdiction to go in and adopt on their own, which is allowed uh, so they can have some consistent enforcement of this in their jurisdiction without having to go through and provide and approval for every alternate means and method for this request. So that's my spiel. Thank you. If you want to put the proposal on the screen story, that'd be great. Thank you, Micah. Um, <clears throat> Roger, I'm not going to skip over you. I would just like to call on Corey just to, um, if you could give us some uh, background to the, um, to how this vote went on the tag and kind of the justification behind it just to help our committee members. Certainly. So one of the issues with air admittance valves is they are a mechanical device. They can be put on any fixture. Um, for the installation, you could, you could run it, picture a bathroom wall, and you are going to run the vent up from your lap. You can put a louver in the wall so that there's air allowed to get to the device. And it basically is a, a rubber seal that's on a spring. And it's a one-way action. When it needs water, it'll open. The issue is that they fail. And we've been having a lot of discussions just in the industry about, um, we know that it, it had a part of a responsibility of, of, it was part of the cause for spreading COVID in areas. This is a health and safety thing. We take the vent up out of the roof, 10 feet away from any air intake to keep all of those, um, Viruses and things that can travel on gas um, away from people. And that's part of the issue is that these student vents fail. And the other part of the um, idea of the documentation, you have to document where you put one. So regardless of the paperwork on the jurisdiction having authority, you still are required to show where you've put them so that the homeowner knows. And it's a burden to the homeowner. So we've seen them fail over and over. When they put them in commercial buildings, um, it's worse because more people are exposed to it that are unaware um, of a failure. And so in my career, I did TI and service and I fixed, oh, I would say probably 50 that get put in by other people and and you know we just remove them and tie them back into a vent stack. So um, again, that's one of the reasons all the plumbers are opposed to having them is they do fail. Um, there's no way they don't fail at some point. And it's going to be the responsibility of the homeowner or business owner to get it fixed. I hope that led some clarity. Thank you, Corey. Uh, Roger, go ahead. Yeah, my question is not is not about uh, that one. It is about the um, the secondary roof drain sizing. And I and I guess it's a question for John or somebody. I'm I'm curious about this separate piping system. And if you could clarify for me, are we requiring that the secondary drain be a separate piping system or is that already a requirement? Um, or Corey? <laughs> John, John, go ahead and speak to it because this this was his proposal and part of it is, and go ahead, John. Yeah, you, no, you can, you can still combine them. Uh, you can have a scupper 
instead of a secondary roof drain system. This is just, if you do have a separate one, this is what you're supposed to do. You got you to oversize it. And that this is this is an ASC seven. I, yeah. uh, as I was saying, telling them uh, at ASC seven, I argued hard, pretty hard against them putting requirements like this in the ASC seven, but they did anyway. So we're kind we're kind of um, trying to get the two aligned at least. Okay. Thank you. And uh, Larry, go ahead. Larry Andrews, go ahead. Okay, Ken, we'll come back to Larry. Uh, was that me, Tony? Yes. No, my suggestion is is maybe just a little bit, not maybe not abnormal, but if you if you did ex allow this, but put an exception in there because we've done this in the fire code, that you can do this, but the exception is unless the building code official, um, you know, does not approve this section. Or does not allow the air admittance valve so it's an exception that this just goes ahead and it's in there so then micah's point about having all of these people having to apply to get permission it would actually work the opposite way it would just be the jurisdiction just saying yeah we were we use that exception that our building code official does not owe or, or plumbing official does not allow these so my my suggestion is putting just a and an exception in there to allow the code official not to approve these. And then maybe down the line, um, the technology would be better and then other people would accept them and they would not have to do that. So that's just my suggestion. Thank you, Ken. Larry, are you there? Yeah, our, I'd like to address the air admittance valve. Um, I, I do think the the rainfall thing is a great thing, okay? Because we had a collapse of a whole supermarket's roof and luckily nobody died and maybe that would have stopped it. But on the air admittance valve is we go out to people's homes and as soon as you open the door to that house, you know what the problem is. And a lot of these people are sick. I mean, they've been sick for months and they don't even realize what's going on because they have become accustomed to that smell. And so then you, you'll see them on their faces and their arms. They've got sores on their faces, on their arms, and they're going to the doctor to figure out what the problem is. And what the problem is, is the sewer gas is going into the house. OK, and usually what catches it is when somebody else from the family goes to the house and and says, oh, th this don't smell right. And they'll, then they call a plumber and we go out there and fix the problem. OK, the, the, the and and to have a if you're going to do an island vent on a new construction house, there's no reason to use an air admittance valve. There's a procedure in the plumbing code book and how to do it. I mean, I've plumbed thousands of homes and I've never on new construction ever used an air admittance valve. The only time I ever used it was one time in a commercial building when I had a bank vault above us, okay? We don't wanna get these in people's homes just carte blanche. And because you're going to have problems and, and we're going to have sickness. And then that sickness gets passed on from one person to another. Uh, it's not a good idea. Thank you. Thank you and this is from experience. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Go ahead, Micah. Yeah, I, I understand there's concerns. There's always concerns with products. Um, some people feel this is a UPC versus IPC, which is International Plumbing Code, where this is allowed. So there are lots of states around the country that allow air admittance valves without issue. Um, you know, if, if it wasn't a regular request, then there wouldn't be issues with them. <laughs> you know, or, or, you know, with all these different alternative means and methods, it's just, you know, which way do you go? Do you not allow them? Do you allow them? Right now, my understanding from code officials is if they are requested under alternative means and methods and the the 
requester brings in documentation that pretty much says, hey, the IPC allows these and there's you know not that many issues. I don't think I've ever heard of a code official refusing to allow the air admittance valve to be put in under alternate means and methods. I mean, this is how things get into the code. That's how, you know, you go back to the whole PEX plumbing. That was fought against, fought against, fought against, and now it, it's in the plumbing code. You know, they would allow it under alternative means and methods. It, it's the same process. Yes, it may not be the best technology, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't allow it um, when it is allowed elsewhere or it's allowed under alternate means and methods. And again, I'm open to suggestions like Ken's or putting in an appendix so a jurisdiction can still allow it, just a different path to allow it. Uh, again, we're, we're seeing these. Let's put a, provide some code language in there that says what you can and can't do with them. There's no code language now that says what you can and can't do with them when it comes in under an alternative means and methods. So if it gets approved, the plumber can put it in however they want. This at least provides some guidance that's standardized across the state, whether it's in the appendices or where else. I think it's a good way to get some code language to provide guidance. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. Corey, go ahead. Yeah, I don't think it's so much a IPC or UPC. It's it's a health and safety concern, and there are multiple, there are books full of issues that have happened from these devices failing. I I have had my own experience, and there are any plumber will tell you the the device fails. And so currently, there's a method if somebody is doing a development, they want to use them, whether it's a multifamily or whatever situation they're using where they want to use a student event, they can do it. Um, this, this supposed burden, um, look, for, for just for health and safety, there's a way they can do it if they, if they want to. Uh, we don't need to open it statewide. And, and putting these devices in, in particularly single family homes is where people get real sick. I've seen one at a hospital, a small hospital, somebody put one in, um, the tenant, died they didn't realize they thought the smell in the room was from her dying and it took them three days to realize they had another tenant in there they realized they had a student event that had failed so do we know for sure that the student event failing maybe caused that death no but the evidence is there and i'm just telling you from a plumber standpoint um, this tag committee denied that there is an opportunity for them to be used it is a device that wants to get sold but I don't recommend putting it into the code. Thank you, Corey. Chris, go ahead. Um, I've got a question. If this is such a health issue, um, have there been lawsuits against this? No, maybe a class action type of lawsuit. Um, I would imagine that if all these people are getting sick, that um, and there's so many failures of these devices that uh, something would have been uh, brought up. I'm kind of on the fence whether or not this should be in the code. Uh, we currently allow them in, in Thurston County. Um, I've not heard any complaints from the plumbers in our jurisdiction that say they shouldn't be uh, allowed. Um, I'm with Micah. I think it should be in the appendix as or an option for the jurisdiction Corey, would you like to address that? Thank you, Mr. Chair. So one of the issues that is true is that you can't test the device. Normally you install the waste and vent piping, block off the um, portion you're gonna test on the drain and you test it through the vent and you put either a water test, um, depending on your piping, you can use air, but there's a testing method in the code to make sure the plumbing is um, leak free and you can't test the devices they won't hold a test so you have to put them on after and they are a mechanical device and anybody who does anything with mechanical devices understands that at some point it will fail a vent through the roof will never fail and that's part of the reason why we shouldn't put it in the code thank you corey larry go ahead to address mike's comment PEX pipe doesn't make you sick, doesn't put you in the hospital, okay? These will, okay? And it, it's, the other thing is there's no, nothing to track these from homeowner to homeowner to homeowner. 
you, 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 they're supposed to put it in a documentation, but does the jurisdiction mark that this house has a studer vet at this location? No. So, so what happens is, is as we change homes, people lose track of what's in the home. And so then we have these problems, okay? And, and it's not a problem that you wanna have. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Micah, go ahead. Sorry, I'll, I'll one more comment and be quiet on this one. Um, I'm not a plumber <laughs> by any means. I'm a code official. We were just looking for some consistent way to have some code language. There, there's nothing now that provides consistent code language. There's no reporting requirements. There's no documentation requirements other than could you allow this as an alternate means and method? And that's the, that's the information we get. That's the reports we get and it's kept on file. Um, there's no location requirements. There's no identification requirements. There is nothing in the code that tells the code official when this is put in, this is what you inspect or review or what is expected to have provided. It's just, hey, can I put this in under an alternate means and methods? And 99% of the time, the answer is yes. And there's no other guidance for the inspector, for, for anything, for, for the homeowner, th there's nothing. So, and again, that's my request to the tag is, if there's no guidance currently, is there a way to provide guidance? Is this the way to do it? I don't know. But if you put it in the appendix, there's at least something there. Cause right now there's nothing. That's my argument. Again, I'm not a plumber. I'm not looking at all the data on whether it makes you sick and how often it does that. We just get these under alternate means and methods requests regularly, not just me as previously, code officials across the state, just looking for a way to provide some guidance. That's it. Thank you, Michael. Roger, go ahead. Um, I, I, res, I'm, I recognize Micah's concern. Um, but I also, as a structural engineer, the, the uh, alternate means and methods for me is typically a performance-based seismic design. And yes, there is a lot of documentation out there about the process to do that, but it is not in the code. You know, the code just says you can do it. And then there are other documents that you go to. So I'm, I recognize the, pro the challenge that you're in is if somebody comes to you and says, I want to use this, um, you're looking for some documentation or process to say yay or nay to that but i'm not sure putting it in the code i would be against putting it in the code maybe um an addendum but even that i would say you know go elsewhere and find uh have somebody propose this and say here's the information here's why i think it works and, and then you can make that determination so it's my thought thank you roger I like that thought, Roger. Sorry, I'll jump in. Corey, and that's a question maybe for Corey as, as a plumber or previous plumber. <laughs> Do you provide the information similar to code language on where these are allowed under the alternative means and methods and how to install them, stuff like that? I was under the understanding that in Seattle, they still required location. And the inspector inspecting the building needs to confirm if you put it in a wall that it's got a louver and what happens often in that case as well is that they'll put the louver in there, get the plumbing inspection, get it finaled off, and then they cover it up because nobody wants a louver in their hallway or a wall that, you know, um, can spit out gas. So anyway, um, in this regard, I think the alternate means and method gives the people building this product the ability to sell it in Washington State. It is a health and safety concern that um, I don't think we should put it in the code. And, and again, um, I'm not the only opinion, but I don't know of a plumber that um, wants to use an air admittance valve because we all know you can't test them, right? You can't, you have to put them in after the fact and every mechanical device will fail and people do get sick. Thank you, Corey. Chris, go ahead. Why has the plumbing, or excuse me, let me start again. If this is such a critical issue, why has there not been legislation to have them prohibited in Washington State? 
the prohibition has been that it's not been allowed in the code and we can't stop a product from being used. If a ways, alternate means and method is used, then a dangerous product can be put into a building. And it's not just true of student events, it's true of anything. So that's the way we've been able to protect the health and safety of Washingtonians for my entire career. Thank you, Corey. Micah, go ahead. So uh, obviously there's some differing of opinions. I would like to make a motion that we move this to the full council as an appendix recommendation and let the full council make the decision on allowing this as an appendices and not a main body of the code proposal. Okay, we have a motion on the table. Do we have a second? Yeah, I will second that. Okay, we have a motion and a second. And any discussion? I'll jump in again. I, I think it would be a, a good item to have and let the entire council make a vote on the appendix part of it. Uh, again, I, I can I can totally uh, agree with Corey and everybody else that maybe this isn't a main body code item for the state, but I think this would provide some guidance for jurisdictions that are allowing these regularly. So I appreciate the consideration to have this in as an appendices and let the full council decide on that. Thanks. Corey, go ahead. I would be voting against this. I would like this to go to the full council as shown that it was disapproved. And then we can have that discussion in the council meeting if they choose to change it. Thank you, Corey. Todd, go ahead. So Micah, is it, can you think of another strong precedent where you're trying to, I mean, I, I can think of a few, but in the plumbing code where you're, you're throwing it to the local jurisdiction, because ultimately that's what you're proposing, right? Uh, that's where it is currently, Todd. And so, but there's no code language on, again, Corey mentioned, yeah, you're supposed to provide location and stuff like that information on the alternative means and method, but that's not necessarily the case that, that occurs every time. And so this would at least provide some consistent language and requirements for the code official to use across the state if they so choose, instead of just winging it under an alternative means and methods item for each jurisdiction. And, and just a follow up for both Corey and Micah, you know, is is there precedent in the plumbing code then where at least having this appendix, even if not adopted by a local jurisdiction, that it provides guidance on alternative means and methods? Or is that not appropriate use of an unadopted appendix? Well, we have an issue as well from the residential electrical code where they're referencing appendix L and that's not currently adopted in the UPC. So, I mean, um, I referencing, I guess, if you put it in the code, whatever rules you put with it and make it available to the, uh, the state, I think um, it's going to create some problems. Okay, because there's, there's not a, a I'm trying, what I mean, I'm trying to flesh out here is, is there a negative to putting in an appendix and having that available for local jurisdictions to use as they see fit? I would say it's not a negative. Um, I think there's a lot of other things that folks say, hey, this this doesn't belong in the main body, but it's it's beneficial to have for jurisdictions as a standard approach if they so choose. So there's a lot of things, in my opinion, that go in the appendices that way. Uh, tiny houses is one of them. Tiny houses are not appropriate in the main body of the code necessarily. Uh, so there's an appendix for that. Uh, there's a lot of stuff like that. So for me, the issue being there are many plumbing inspectors that aren't plumbers. Building officials in small jurisdictions do the plumbing inspection. And so when we have people that aren't qualified plumbers, they're not really gonna know what they're looking at anyway. If you allow this to be used in Washington state, there will be instances where a person signs it off not being aware of some of the other requirements or what a student event even is. So um, it, there's a lot of problems. Um, associated with it because we have people inspecting plumbing work that aren't plumbers. That's one issue. And again, they have a way to sell this product through means and method. And I believe we should stick with that and leave it out of the code in all forms. I would like to uh, call the question. 
Do I have a second? I'll second your call question. Thank you, Micah. Um, <clears throat> okay, with that, we're gonna take a roll call on the motion on the table. Cody. So to be clear, we're trying to change this so that it goes to the council in a different form, that it wasn't disapproved, that it's gonna be uh, moved to an appendix, yes? That's correct. Then I will vote no. Todd? I'll vote aye to further consideration. Uh, do you say aye? Aye, sorry. Okay. Micah? Aye. Uh, Diamond? Aye. Robert? Oh, he is out. Uh, Roger? Aye. Okay, so motion we have... carries four to one. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Tony. Okay, with that, do we have any uh, further discussion on the remaining items on the um, proposals from the UPC type? Okay, with that, to move things forward, we'll need a motion. Go ahead, Micah. I'll make a motion to move the, are we on the IR, what are we on there, Story. <laughs> move the IPC uh, proposals forward as modified. Move the UPC as modified. Okay. Yes. Do we have a second? I'll second that. Thank you, Roger. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any against? Against. Okay, we have uh, four ayes and one against. Motion carries. Thank you. So for purposes of clarity, I will have the proposals that the, the committee agreed with. I will have these proposals accepted, moved to council. And for Micah's proposal, I will have it like uh, moved to council as an appendix. So I will have individual uh, recommendation for each of these proposals. Thank you, Stoyan. Okay, with that, let's move to the uh, Wildland Urban Interface Code. And Micah, your work is not done. <laughs> um, so we had two tag meetings on this. Uh, they were, uh, there was a lot of work done prior to the tag with other groups that put together a proposal to bring forward uh, through this process, through the adoption process of the State Building Code Council uh, to clarify some things with uh, previous legislation. And uh, Micah, you can, again, as I've said so many times before, correct me if I'm off base here, but basically with the way that the um, legislation was written originally, it, it was unclear, there were unclear paths to get to um, our enforcement methods, basically. What this tag's um, workload was, and the groups before us that, that proposed these with the proposals, <clears throat> was to adopt the Wildland Urban Interface Code with amendments at the state level to be able to apply not only um, un understanding the mapping through DNR, which was part of that legislation, uh, but also to be able to understand and provide a clear path to uh, the proper enforcement of this code. And I can kind of sum it up as a, it, it's a lot of clarifying um, is, is what went into this. At the end of the, the two tag meetings that we were able to squeeze in before the BFP and the council, uh, at the end of it, we ended up approving as modified the, let's see, it was 058R, which is revised at the tag level. There were two remaining proposals that um, provided pathways via tables or charts, if you will, that the tag did not fill, we had enough time to vet. And so disapprove those because it was kind of an either or. Um, it was one or the other is, is what we kind of came down to. 
And can you just pull, there you go, can you stay right there? So 59 and 60 log numbers, the 59 and 60, those were not proposed to be adopted as a whole or both. They were one or the other. And because of the limited amount of time that we had during the take process, um, we decided to disapprove those and, and uh, basically fight that battle the next round. So, um, Micah, do you have anything to add to this? I have a whole bunch to add. Okay. <laughs> um, however, could I request a five minute break before I get into that? Yes, let's go ahead and adjourn until 11.15 and we'll come back at 11.15. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll call this meeting back to order. And if uh, Micah is, oh, go ahead, Roger. I would request, Tony, um, you you said the legislation and I, um, I would ask if either you or Micah could um, summarize what the legislation is. Sure. Thank you, Roger. Micah, go ahead. I'll turn the floor over to you. Okay, great. Uh, good question, Roger, to clarify and provide information to everyone on what, what we're trying to do here and why. Um, there was legislation put in that brought over the wildland urban interface code. They had worked on it for several legislative cycles um, through ICC regional representative Craig Stevenson. And they did not, in my opinion, and I guess a lot of folks opinion, they did not go with the standard process where they say the state building code act shall include such and such code IBC, IRC wildland urban interface code. Um, instead of they did is they only adopted portions of it and those portions are you can see that well on the screen this is where under the state building code act 19 27 31 that it says the portions of the wildland urban interface code as a different rcw so this is where they got into the legislators took portions of code and made it law which is not the standard process so what RCW 1927-560 does is it adopted the most restrictive ignition resistant classification of construction if you fall into a WUI code, a WUI area. I mean, it's, it's WUI is Wildland Urban Interface Code short, okay? Um, and so what this does, the legislation actually requires you apply the WUI code where the DNR mapping indicates that. Of course, that wasn't clear in the legislation in the RCW here. It's not clear on how to apply that map, does uh, all these different things. So all these moving parts had to come into play and they don't function well. Um, then when you go into the, the WUI code, there's no option. It's if you fall into a urban interface or urban intermix area, you have to construct to these requirements of the RCW. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. Um, and, and that's not beneficial to a developer. That's not beneficial to a code official or, or anything else. And it's not beneficial in mitigating uh, some of the risks that are associated with wildland urban interface um, areas. The rest of the wildland urban interface code allows for some of those mitigate, mitigation measures that don't deal directly with the construction or structures. In other words, if you see here on the screen, these are specific to roof coverings, envelope, exterior walls, things like that. You have to do this if you fall within one of those two areas. And it's not clear on the map how those areas clearly function. And what I mean by that is the map is based on 40 acre areas. Um, that's how it was developed through DNR. And so when you take that base GIS information from them and you overlay it on a parcel map for your jurisdiction, it doesn't align very well. There's, there's parcels are half in, half out. There's no guidance on what you do there. Um, and there, again, there's no options for mitigating other issues. And so what we, we when I say we, uh, code officials brought this up significantly. Some fire code officials did as well. And so we, through the Washington Association of Building Officials and the Washington State Fire Marshal's Office, we developed a work group that we were going to 
come in and, and modify the entire wildland urban interface code. And we're gonna work with the original proponents of the legislation to essentially remove this RCW and just adopt the wildland urban interface code like the other codes and allow the state building code council to develop changes and, or, you know, everybody to develop changes, but um, adopt a code that's functioning and it ties into that DNR mapping as the legislation requires. So there's several moving parts that have to occur here. However, we did make the changes in the wildland urban interface code to if the legislators did not repeal this law, that it would still function and still allow other options. So that's kind of where we're at in a nutshell. And that's what we mean by the legislation in, in code. Does that hopefully answer some questions and provide some guidance? Yeah, so the proposal is, is the what we would adopt now um, with the possibility that the legislation would get changed at a later date. Yes. Yeah, okay. Okay. Thank you. Yep. I, I want to provide a little bit more clarity or, or, or make it worse, we'll, we'll see. But uh, we had this language, this was the we caught, it was an appendix in the fire court. And the council decided to repeal that. And here is the effective date. Okay, it was an emergency rule. The council decided to repeal this. Uh, it's effective February 16, 2022. So currently we don't have anything in 2018 uh, uh, fire code. We don't have we code. And the assumption was that, you know, the council will work on something and will adopt something. And I understand that we started late for many reasons. We didn't have the seats approved by the council. We didn't have enough applications for uh, technical advisory group members. I, I reviewed the proposals uh, a couple of days ago after after uh, the, the WE meeting, and I found many, uh, actually too many inconsistencies. I have two proposals. One, in, one is an award document. The other one is on a PDF document. There are differences between these two proposals as well, these two different documents. So I can I can offer another option if you and the council want to take it into consideration. And, and uh, I, I have a couple more days to research that. So this is kind of a rough uh, a proposal. But another option that the council have is to adopt whatever it was uh, in the fire code before or adopt the language as it is in the RCW and uh, the we code, if we need more time for the we code, the we code can be adopted under a different, uh, with a different off cycle rulemaking. That, that's an option too. Again, I haven't researched it. Um, I had a dream last night, I woke up early, but I, I, I will have more time to research that, but I, think this is an option if again we we get stuck with the time and we are already stuck with the time because if we expand and we have a few more council meetings uh, I'm sorry uh, we technical advisory group meetings the schedule is so tight that there will be a time we won't have days for uh, conducting other meetings that's my two cents thank you sorry go ahead Micah yeah, I, I appreciate you jumping in there, Stoyan, and adding that information on the WAC that I left out. There were some rules adopted by the SBCC in addition to this legislation. However, those rules made it even more confusing. Um, and that's why, again, in coordination with the Washington State Fire Marshals Association, we recommended repealing those rules because it wasn't clear and it added more problems. Um, added other sections for reference and that wasn't clear on what that meant. Um, and, and so it was, it made it even worse. So that was why we repealed that. Uh, I, I don't necessarily recommend going back to that language. It's not clean, it's not clear. It has no direct tie into the DNR mapping and it has no direct tie into RCW 560. And so the path we're trying to take is the one I'm gonna strongly recommend we stay on. And um, the only two items that are kind of in dispute or not dispute that were not recommended for approval by the tag were two different types of, I want to call them um, 
guidance proposals. They're tables that provide guidance on how to apply the DNR map. And those just weren't clear. And so we either need to coordinate to get those correct. But again, the disapproval wasn't based on the information in them. The disapproval was we're not sure which one to choose and we're not clear on if both items provide enough information for a an applicant or a jurisdiction to fully um, utilize them in determining wildland urban interface areas. So, so it wasn't that the tables were bad, it just they weren't a hundred percent on either one of them according to the tag. So um, I'll leave it at that for a minute and it looks like Peter wants to jump on and then we can kind of get into proposals. I know we got 35 minutes left and there's a lot in the WUI code. Thanks, Micah. Peter, go ahead. Yeah, I wanted to say that, you know, the vast majority of the code put together by the experts in in uh, fire uh, issues, fire, fire folks, the, the fenestration folks, the doorway folks, the building, all, all of that was was an incredible amount of work, which was very, very valuable to this. And that was contained in the vast majority of what what the TAG uh, proposed that we approve. Uh, unfortunately, one of the key aspects is these two tables, which are an integral part of the whole thing. And so uh, we had to come up with that. And if you put those two tables back up or one of those two tables back up, uh, the way that I view this and, and being a relative newcomer to this kind of problem is, is, is that I looked at the, the DNR map and I looked at where I lived and I said, if I wanted to develop my neighbor's property, who does want to do that, he would not be able to do so. He would be in a yellow zone, but he's clearly not in a yellow zone. He's in a green zone. Uh, there's really, but so the, the maps are inaccurate enough that there needs to be a way for an applicant or the code official to determine which value, uh, which region somebody is actually in and then provide documentation for that. And I think that was the intent of these tables. Am I correct, Micah? Yes, that is the intent. Okay, so now if I go to this table, and I look at it, I have to A, determine what my structure density is per 40 acres. And I can probably figure that out by looking at the maps and counting the structures within what I, you know, assuming that my 40 acres falls fully within a yellow or red zone, I can sit down and count those number of structures and come up with a value. It would be happy, nice to have a map that actually gave me that value without a lot of work, but nonetheless we can still get there however the really the problem came down to the vegetative density what is vegetative density and what does it mean and am i at 50 50 to 75 or 75 plus and that you can't get out of the dnr map right now uh, so if the dnr map is wrong for your area then you don't have a way to use these tables effectively to determine whether or not you can you know, make an alternate decision, a new finding of fact, I guess is the appropriate term. So that's how I saw the problem here is, is that there wasn't enough definition of these terms and alternate ways to look them up. Uh, I think if we solve that problem, then we can put that into the main chunk of code and send it all on to the main council. But unfortunately we weren't able to do that before today, uh, so. Uh, Micah, you might want to comment on whether I get this right or wrong. So, uh, and uh, so I appreciate your input there. Thank you, Peter. And Micah, you can, I don't know what your, your direction is uh, as far as where you want to take this today. Sitting through the two tag meetings and chairing those uh, in the last two weeks, I, I don't believe that this is my opinion for the committee, that I don't believe that taking these tables to the committee for approving and taking to council is wise because of the limited amount of time we had to vet them at the TAG level. And so I don't know if this platform and with the, the amount of time we had in the TAG meeting, 
is the right time to go through it. Um, but that's my opinion. And Micah, with that, I'll turn it over to you. And what do you mean by that? We would send the tables back to the tag and we'd end up having to have a special SBCC meeting, correct? Is that what you're indicating? Not necessarily, Micah. My recommendation would be for the DFP to um, approve as uh, approve the tag recommendations, which is right now is there's not enough time to vet the tables, the, the, the other two proposals. And so we would just have to find a, a, another means or another cycle to go through at a okay. later date to go through it. Okay. So sounds like a plan somewhat. <laughs> uh, I, I definitely, um, I'll be biased, of course. Uh, the table shown on the screen is the one I developed after the previous one was developed. That would have been uh, done by another um, individual on the work group, Tracy Harvey. I'm not sure she's represented here today. H however, when myself and others on the work group started going through the proposal she had put together, the table she had put together, it was unclear on what it meant. The alignments for the color coding to the um, colors indicated on the DNR map were not correct. And so that's why I developed this one. So, I, you know, I do want to explain what this table does. Um, Stoyan, if you wouldn't mind, and I don't know if you have it open, Stoyan, the DNR map so we can at least give a little information on what what that is and for folks that haven't seen it and maybe while you're pulling that up if uh, Roger wants to jump in on something. Sure, my, my question is, is if we if we approve it as shown where you're, we're approving all sections of the wildland urban interface code with amendments, but we are not moving the, how does that function without the two tables or does it function without the two tables? There's still, well, Micah, you can go ahead and comment on that. It, it will function. It just will, it, it will again, provide unclear and ambiguous, you know, direction. In other words, when you go to the DNR map, and if Stoyan wants to pull it up, if he gets the chance, um, there's seven different colors on that DNR map. And when you are in two of them, that's when the wildland urban interface code applies. The rest of them, it technically does not apply. And so without understanding how to, how to make a determination of fact, in other words, in the legislation, they called it finding of fact, a jurisdiction, um, an applicant can do a finding of fact that says I'm either um, in a uninhabited vegetated area, I'm in a non-vegetated habited area, I am in a, a intermix area, I am an interface area, or any of these other seven colors, how do I apply the WUI code? Does it apply? The answer is no. What Peter brought up about his neighbor's area being in a green what Stoyan brings this color up, the areas in green, there's two different colors of green. One is, one, the light color is like state parks, national parks. Obviously, you're not going to be building in those, so they'll stay green. However, current areas that are undeveloped, there's no path for you to make a determination, either the applicant or the code official, to determine whether it's a red or yellow. Or, if it cannot be in a gray area where the gray area on the legend is a, a developed, but there's no vegetation, there's nothing, you know, that's going to be impacted by wildfire. Um, and I'm not sure if you can show the legend on that story, but if you wanted to scroll in a little more to, to say um, an area that's got some of the various colors. Uh, so what the tables did is it provided some guidance on how to do that because there's nothing in the map that says go this route. Um, so if you have a proposal for a development in the green area, so you see how much area of the state is green, that's not in a wildland urban interface area. It's not classified as anything. It's, it's classified as vegetated, uninhabited. So in other words, there's no houses, there's no structures. So Obviously, you know, as our population grows, we have to spread out a little more. You know, everybody wants to go up, but that doesn't necessarily happen in every jurisdiction. So if you have um, a green area and you have a development proposed in it, 
excuse me, does that area fall within the wildland urban interface code? Technically it could, if you're putting structures and you would have to make that determination, but there's no mechanism showing that. So the answer would be, yes, you could adopt the code that we've proposed without the tables. However, you're not gonna have a mechanism to understand whether or not you're within a wildland urban interface code or if an applicant or a jurisdiction has the authorization to make a changed determination. In other words, if, if, if somebody's in a red area or a yellow area, you can challenge those findings. And, and that is stated in the legislation that you can do finding a fact that the, the map from DNR is not set in stone. Uh, and that's, what, that's what Peter's neighbor would do. Yes, he would have to do a finding of fact. However, there's no guidance on how to do that currently. And that's what those tables are for. That's not, there's not even a, a determination or a path to do that in the code currently either. And so that's what this would help with. So <clears throat> at this point, if Peter's neighbor provided or, or proposed this development and it's in a complete green area and all he had to do is follow the map and that's all the code official was going to do, Peter's neighbor would not have to provide any wildland urban interface construction requirements. He would not have to meet the RCW 560. Be even if it is a heavily vegetated area because it is not mapped as a wildland urban interface area or wildland urban intermix area, which is the red and green, or excuse me, which is the red and yellow areas on the map. Does that make sense at all? Sure. <laughs> clear, clear as mud. Yeah. <laughs> Which, which I guess, and I and Peter, I'll let you talk. My my other comment is, the legislature passed something that said we need to consider this, right? The, the interaction between wildfires and and urban areas. Um, what they passed was unclear, and what it appears to me, I mean, it, it obviously the group that. The group that is proposing is a uh, looks like it's a very extensive group. Understands what they're what they're talking about, what they're doing. This proposal may not be completely clear yet, but is it a step forward from what we currently have? Because I believe that we've been directed by the legislature to pass something, right, to have this code and to implement this code. So my, I, I guess, a general question. Is this a step forward over what we currently have, even though we know we need to continue to define things better? So I don't know if Peter or Michael wants to comment on that. Well, let me let me just clarify. Uh, my neighbor actually is is currently in a yellow area, and that actually extends up to the side of my house. I'm in a gray area, so uh, not he's not. I don't want. I I misspoke there. He should be in a gray area, not a green area. So I'm verbally colorblind, <laughs> if you will. Uh, but yeah, I that I think that's the major concern we have here is without the tables, can we move this forward at all? Uh, and without any way to uh, do a finding of fact, uh, even though the vast majority of the code uh, is really quite excellent, except for this one small section, without an ability for an applicant or the code official to understand that the designation by the DNR is a first step, and then you have to look carefully at the property because there's gonna be a lot of errors, especially in the interface between gray uh, and yellow, and yellow and red, at those interfaces, they're, they're ability to get it right is going to decrease. If you're in the middle of a big yellow area, it's probably correct. Mm -hmm. If you're at an interface where all of your development is gonna be, then it's gonna have a much higher probability of being wrong. Uh, and so I'm concerned that, that if we pass this code, a lot of folks are gonna say, oh, I'm in the yellow, but I don't have any way to say that that's not appropriate. And the DNR basically says, uh, yeah, it, you know, if, if they feel it's, it's wrong, then send us, you know, some proof and we'll change the map. Uh, and there's no way to really do that right now. And that's the problem I have 
Uh, and I, I'm too inexperienced in this whole process to really say whether we should move it on or, or, or what to do with it, but I have major concerns, so. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Micah, go ahead. So thanks, Peter and Roger, for those points. And Peter, thanks for clarifying the colors. And what Peter's talking about is the gray area on the map, um, that is, is habited like city cinder type areas where there's no impact while an urban interface. And so if his neighbor's area is in yellow and his neighbor has vacant land and he's gonna fully develop that land and he would like to classify it as gray, meaning he would not, in the gray areas, you do not have to meet the wildland urban interface code. However, if it's mapped as yellow, all those structures within that development that Peter's neighbor would build would have to meet the RCW 560 language as currently written. However, there's no way for him to, to say, hey, wait a minute, that's a lot of extra cost that if I'm classified as a gray area, I shouldn't have to endure. And so that's what that table does. And, and if you can go back to my table real quick, Stoyan, and, and then I'll, I'll speak to it for a minute and we'll speak to the one of Tracy's. So my table here, it's not specific to a color on the map, it's generic. So if you're in a gray area or, or a yellow area, you can still go through this process on my table here and determine if you're in a, a, another area that's not meeting a yellow or red. If you go to trace the other table, to, story in real quick, the other table only indicates red, yellow, and green. It's, it's very specific, so that's why I went and did a different table because that's not all that's on the map. There's several other colors. And so that's why, it, in, in, again, I'm biased towards mine. It's more generic, but it still gets you to the same place. You're still determining whether or not you are technically in a red or yellow area. That's all you need to know. If you fall within a red or yellow area, the wildland urban interface code applies, period. If you're in any of those other colors, it doesn't apply. And, and so now if you go back to my table story and you'll see, and I'll walk through you through it. So again, I, I will of course make a motion to support it and I'll explain why. So what you need to determine as an applicant or a code official first is structure density. If there's no structures, it's uninhabited. That's gonna be most of those green areas. <clears throat> so then you're gonna have to determine if it's non-vegetated or vegetated to a certain percentage or if you're within a certain distance of vegetation that would impact your structures. In other words, that wildland urban interface impact. And that's based on your 40 acres or less. That's one in item number one and two, structure density, vegetation density. There's methods through the code and some other information on how you to determine that. Then item three on this list is gives you that answer. <laughs> does the wildland urban interface code apply to you? In other words, are you a yellow or a red? And maybe we just need to add a question right there. Am I yes or no? Is, is it under yes means it's yellow or red. Under no, it's all the other colors. And maybe that's just a modification we need to make. If you fall under the yes, either you can have structure density from um, very low to high and your vegetation is greater than 50%, you fall within a yellow or red color, you're the WUI code applies. Same with the structure density. <clears throat> you can be very high to low. You can be um, greater than 50% vegetated and, and less than 1.5 miles from an area that's greater than 75% vegetated. You're gonna, the wildland urban interface code will apply. You will be classified as a red or yellow color. <clears throat> and then the last one on the yes um, column, is your structure density again, which you've already determined, very low or high, and you are less than one and a half miles. In other words, you could have less than 50% vegetated, but you would still be within one and a half miles of an area that's greater than 75% vegetated. So you would still be classified as yellow or red and be within the WUI code. Under the no columns, if you have no structures, hey, that's a zero uninhabited, you're not in the WUI code at this point. Once you put a structure on there, then you're going to determine your, your vegetation. And again, um, 
both of the other two nodes just come down to vegetation. Whether you're, you're greater than 50% or, <coughs> excuse me, if you're less than 50%, but still within that one and a half miles or greater than the one and a half miles. <coughs> I'm talking too much, folks. Um, you're gonna, you're not gonna fall within the wooing code. So if we scroll down to number four, these are the two that say, yes, I am in the wooing code. It is either yellow or red, and maybe I need to indicate those here first. I believe the intermix is red and the interface is yellow. So we could make two ads to this table to make it more clear. So again, if you're intermix or interface, that's when the wildland urban interface code applies. If you're any other color on that map, it doesn't apply. It doesn't affect you until if you're in a green area, that is, it doesn't affect you until you make a determination otherwise. It still may not affect you if you're in a green area, like Peter's neighbor, say, say he's in a green area, but he's adjacent to a gray area because he's uninhabited and it's vegetated. And he strips all that, you, everybody's seen those developments, they strip all the vegetation and they build a bunch of structures. So he could technically be classified as a gray area and still not have the WUI code apply. There's no guidance on how to do that. This table does it in somewhat a generic way. Maybe we need to add, do a couple of ads to it, <clears throat> but I think we need to maybe do that under public comment but again, I don't want the tag recommendation necessary to be, hey, we're disapproving this just because we didn't have enough time. That's not saying the information's incorrect. That's just saying we didn't have enough time. And so I, you know, I, I'll disagree with Tony on that one a little bit. I, I think we need to overturn a recommendation because one of these needs to be in the code with the rest of the proposal. Um, I think this one is more clear. It is a little more generic and will provide some guidance on that mapping. Um, that's my spiel for a few minutes. I'll let, we have other hands raised, sorry. Thank you, Micah. Uh, Todd, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Okay, so I'm gonna verbalize what I think we as, as, as committee members are being asked to take action on today. So if we go way out on Friday, the council is trying to move these into public process, public comment period, which is called the CR 102. So today as a committee, we're making recommendations to the, the council uh, based off the of the tag work, and what I'm hearing is there was there's something moving forward from the tag level, which is the main proposal. Uh, yet the tag determined there's a hole, therefore there are two proposals to fill potentially fill that hole. Neither may be perfect, or maybe they are. I'm not the, the subject matter expert here. And, and what Mike is making the case for here is that this might be the best structure to get the best feedback from. It, it may not be perfected here maybe, but this would, in the public comment period, this would give us the best feedback. And if that's the case, then I'm supportive of, of, of what I'm hearing from Micah's proposal. Is that, is there any anything wrong in that whole? No, that's correct, that's, okay. that's, that's correct line of thinking. Um, <clears throat> and just back to my comments quickly, and I understand uh, Micah's disagreements on it. Um, the, the question, the, the term from, Todd said, you know, he said, are these perfect or do they need work? You know, I don't know. And I think my biggest hesitancy is, is neither does the tag. And knowing what the tag process um, and the state building code council process is, the heavy lifting is oftentimes done at the tag level by those that have signed up with the expertise and the discomfort of the tag to not move forward with them because I don't know that there's a great understanding of, of either of the tables because of time. Um, time was the issue here and the amount of time we had available to meet. Um, that's my hesitancy on it. I'm, I'm not saying that either one is good or bad either. I don't know that the tag knows that answer and that's my issue with moving either one forward. And so, um, with that, I'll go to Chris and then Micah. Go ahead, Chris. Hi. Um, yes, I think we need one a table. It has to. There has to be a table. I think Micah's is closer than anyone else's table. Um, 
what it comes down to, Micah, is that when you get to, once you've made your determination based on one, two, and three, when you get to four, you're just in the intermix. You're, you're in the wooey. You have to go to chapter five and start determining how you're going to comply with the Wildland Urban Interface Code. In table 502, they talk about a fuel model and they talk about the number of days for critical weather frequency. I don't know where that's defined and I apologize for not speaking about that on Monday or Friday. Because um, it took me a while to understand that 560 had to be repealed in order for this to go forward. Okay, so once you go forward and, and once we can, we can get that through an interpretation, I'm not worried about that. But after that, when you get your information from that table, you're gonna go to 503 and then they're going to need to determine whether or not which resistant construction they are. And I think that that uh, just a definition for or, or some kind of an explanation of what the fuel model is would help me a lot. But and I really support Micah's table. I think it's far better than the table prepared by the DNR. It, it's more in agreement with anything. Uh, most of the uh, projects, because grass is considered vegetation are going to end up being in, in the wooey. Um, and I think that covers all my comments. Thanks guys, I appreciate it. This is a lot of hard work and a lot of thought and I'm I concur with Tony. I'm not sure that you're ready to move forward. Thank you, Chris. Um, and, and just clarify just before calling Micah, um, the work that was done by everyone was significant, significant and, and much appreciated and so all those proposals that were brought forth, um, you know, it, it'd be remiss not to mention that it's it's noted how much work was put in on those. Uh, Micah, go ahead. I'll address Chris's comments in a moment, but I wanna also mention that at the tag level, when we talk about the two tables, um, if you remember at the tag, Mark Young spoke, he was the primary representative from the state fire marshal's office as well on the work group. And he agreed that um, my table was the most clear and provided the, the most accurate information moving forward. Um, he, he didn't disagree, disagree with Tracy's fully, but he also raised some of the concerns I did that it was that it was too specific and it was actually factually incorrect on a couple of items. Um, where if you're in a red area, you're in a, a high hazard, but if you're in a yellow, you're not. And that's not the case based on the WUI. So again, the state fire marshals office, at least the primary representative of the work group, he was in favor of the table I put forward as well. And then moving on to, and he spoke to such as the tag uh, at the tag meeting. So I uh, just wanted to point that out for, for my table, my bias on my table. <laughs> um, and then going back to Chris's question on the additional tables in 502 and 503. So if you want to go back to the other, the code where you just were storing, sorry to make you switch again. Um, probably making everybody seasick, uh, but 502 and 503 are the optional methods to construct in the wildland urban interface code. So the main proposal that we discussed and is what we brought up was the modifications to, to 501 pretty much are bringing over the requirements of RCW 560. That's the, that's the direction we went. So 560 is almost going to be like, hey, if you fall within the WUI code, go do these items and you don't have to do anything else. But that provides no option. So is what we wanted to is allow for applicants to have the option to go through the full path of the wildland urban interface code. If you'll scroll up to 502, Storian. That full path will allow you to walk through and determine a fire hazard severity. You could do a vegetation reduction plan. You can do a fire protection plan that would, would also benefit a lower fire hazard severity. And then you would move into 503, <coughs> if you'll scroll down, Stoyan, which would allow you to determine a lower ignition resistant construction requirement. 
So in other words, RCW 560 is very restrictive. But if you can prove kind of like an alternative means and methods, which we've talked about before, um, that's kind of what this is. This allows you the option to go through that as an applicant. You can say, hey, I don't want to construct to that. I'm going to go do findings of fact and prove that I'm in a lower ignition resistant classification. And that's what we did in the code. And that's what that table allows you to do as well. It will give you some guidance on whether or not that you apply to the WUI or the WUI applies to you. And then it will, then you can go into here and say, hey, I'm going to, it applies to me, but I don't want to do everything that's very restrictive. We're going to provide a better path. So um, there you go. That Hopefully that answers your questions, Chris. Thank you, Micah. Oh, oh, and I believe that fuel modeling is defined in the WUI code under definitions. Yes. Sorry. Go ahead, Todd. Thank you. Um, so again, I, I just want to emphasize that um, what we're doing today is is setting a threshold of whether this should move forward into the public process. So, and if, if anyone disagrees, you know, please please let me know. It's like this last one with plumbing. By no means am I degreeing on technical merits with Corey, who is the expert in this area. I simply had questions on process going in that I, that I would like to hear more about in the public process. So, to me, I don't hear opposition to that this, well, first of all, is mandated to go forward, but that we need to address it in some format, like with these tables. So I'm, I'm perfectly comfortable with this in a council because I want to, the time frame is again, sometime in October, or November, that we're doing final adoption of these. It's a lot of time to work. Unless Tony or Micah, you're, you don't feel there is time in a public process to address the scope of work. I guess for me, Todd, to, to kind of add on to that, I'm not sure we'd have to ask Stoyan. He indicated that if it's disapproved and it's not moved at the council on Friday, they just go with the TAG's recommendation. It would not be included in the CR 102 and therefore we wouldn't be able to modify it or add it later. So I'm hoping to get the disapproval overturned. And if that's getting the disapproval of both tables overturned so we can work on those and then the council decides in November, that's fine too. I have no problem with that. But one or both of these tables need to move forward with some type of recommendation, even if that recommendation has a caveat that these need to be further modified before the final vote. I, I'm in support of that, Mike. I think I'm making the point that the threshold to disapprove is higher than the threshold to approve to continue the process, public process. I, 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 can, uh, <clears throat> I can offer uh, two options for, for the procedure that again, um, it needs to be researched, but uh, so the first one is uh, the BFP committee uh, refers one of the tables, recommends one of the tables for approval. Uh, 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 this table will be included in the CR 102. Uh, we will collect public comments and testimony. And then further, when we get to the final approval, this table can be modified or can be, uh, or can be, uh, withdraw. Uh, the second option that actually needs uh, uh, research, the council approves uh, both tables under, we'll figure that out under a different number or under different options. Uh, both tables uh, go to the CR 102. Uh, we will have the public comments, the public hearings and the testimony, and then uh, the council can make the decision whether or not uh, both tables need to be merged or one table needs to be adopted as modified. The, the, these are the options for the procedure I can offer right now. Thank you, Brian. Corey, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a hard stop here. I've got to go. So um, I'm in agreement to move forward to the process. If I, I can give a few more minutes if you need me for the vote. If not, I'm going to go. If you guys still have your quorum, What's that do for our quorum? Sorry, uh, let me let me count it. So we have one, two, three, four, five people. If Corey leaves, so we will still uh, we'll still have a quorum if if nobody else disappears. Okay, um, I, I Mike it outside of, of the adoption of the of one or both tables 
Are there other things that you would like to address with the, with the WUI? No, and, and I can make a motion, but so Corey has time to vote if that's appropriate, but I want to make sure the public has time. And so Jeanette, you have your hand up. I don't know if you can spend an extra three minutes, Corey. Okay. Jeanette, if you could let, just limit your comments to a minute or two, and then Micah, that's what I would recommend. I'm coming up against a, a hard stop here too. And so um, I'd like to get Jeanette's comment and then Micah, if you can make your motion and we can go from there, that'd be great. Go ahead, Jeanette. Okay. Um, thank you for the opportunity. Um, having sat through the two tag meetings, which was really helpful, we learned a lot. The problem with it is, yeah, there was a lot of work done, but there wasn't a lot of ability to ask questions and to, for parts that might conflict with another or needing more clarification language, um, that was really important. So our recommendation to you would be, this is important work, no, no question, given all the fires. But I think what's really important um, is that these tables get discussed, these, um, you know, because they're critical as Micah has spoken to. Um, I think the other thing is one more tag meeting, I think would help to make sure that we iron things out. And I, I know there's reluctance to do that, the timeline, but if you're gonna do it right, and if you're gonna criticize the legislature for what they do, don't, don't repeat you know, shortchanging this good public policy process. So, I mean, there are a lot of things that need to be discussed and I think one good tag meeting would do it. Thank you. Thanks, Jeanette. Mike, go ahead. Thank you, Jeanette. I, I appreciate the input there. I agree another tag meeting or two would have been beneficial. Unfortunately, we're up at such against a time crunch. And I, I'm, I'm gonna not show my bias here. I would like to make a motion that we overturn the recommendations for both tables <coughs> and move both tables on to the council for further discussion and public comment. That way the council can have a good vetted information and then make a choice from there. So that's my motion to overturn those two approvals and then move the entire package forward to the council with a recommendation. Sorry, I support that motion, second. Okay, we have a motion and a second discussion i just have a real quick i understand the concern you know another tag meeting or two would be good but um and then i also hear todd talking about we have between now and october to continue to work through those wouldn't that include anybody on the tag committee that can be a public comment as we work through the language moving forward that is correct okay and we can also have the tag working on uh, on this so we, even if it's if it's uh, uh, submitted uh, and it's part of the, the initial submit or you know the CR 103, uh, 102, I'm sorry, the TAC can continue working in the language. Okay. Any further discussion? Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any against? Motion carries. Thank you. So that brings us to uh, other business. Does anyone have any other business? I just want to say thanks to everybody. Thanks to all the tag chairs, Corey, Todd, and all the participation. Um, I have been very impressed with the new council members and their participation. It's really nice to see that. We didn't have that before with a lot of the council. We still don't have that with some of the council members, but uh, I believe a lot more of the council members are participating, and I appreciate that. Thanks for everybody's hard work. Thanks, Micah. Thank you. Okay, if there is no other business, then this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Micah. Try and enjoy your vacation. Tony, ah, damn it. Ah, you're here. Can you stay? <laughs>